All right, everybody, we are recording. Mary, you may begin whenever you're ready. Good evening. Welcome to our October 11th, 2021 uh, regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Town of Matthews. I'd like to start with some introductions. Uh, we have our Planning Director, Jay Camp, with us tonight. Commissioner and Pastor Larry Whitley. Assistant Town Manager, Becky Hawk. Town Manager, Hazen Blodgett. Commissioner Jeff Miller, Commissioner John Urban, Mayor Pro Tem Renee Garner, our Communications Coordinator Maureen Keith, Commissioner Ken McCool, our Town Clerk Lori Canapino, and tonight our attorney taking the place of uh, Charlie will be Craig Bowie. So I'd like to remind everyone due to COVID-19 cases uh, that we've seen in the region and concerns regarding the Delta variant, this meeting of the Matthews Board of Commissioners will be once again conducted remotely. The mayor and commissioners will vote on each item by roll call vote, meaning each member will be polled to individually state their vote for the record. They will then raise their hand or otherwise visibly indicate their vote. I also should mention for those watching at home that Commissioner Dave Bland could not be with us tonight. I'd like to move on to agenda item number two, the invocation, Commissioner Miller. Thank you. For those who choose to share in prayer, let us bow our heads, please. Dear God, you have said that where two or more are gathered in your name, that you will be with them. We ask you to be with us now. Bless us and provide guidance to the town of Matthews commissioners with the business brought before us tonight. May we prove worthy of the confidence placed in us by our fellow citizens. May we be honest in our actions and make the best decisions, not only for today, but for years to come. Freedom is not free, so please keep watch over the men and women in the military, the police and fire departments as they serve and protect all of us. We thank you for our civil liberties and freedoms, for our privileges and opportunities. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. We'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance as soon as our virtual flag comes up. Thank you, Jay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to move on to agenda item number four. Uh, Lori, can you put this up or whoever's driving up on the uh, screen? I didn't have an opportunity to print this proclamation off. We're gonna recognize National Arts and Humanities Month. Thank you, Jay. So I'd like to read this proclamation, whereas the coronavirus has had a devastating impact on America's arts sector with 99% of cultural organizations having canceled events and artists being among the most severely affected segment of the nation's workforce. Yet notwithstanding this fact, the arts have helped collectively lead us throughout the darkest times of the pandemic, lifting our spirits, unifying communities and jumpstarting the economy. And whereas the month of October has annually been recognized as National Arts and Humanities Month, by thousands of arts and cultural organizations, including the Arts and Science Council, the local arts agency of the town of Matthews in Mecklenburg County, and by communities and states across the country. And whereas the arts and humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind and play a unique role in the lives of our families and our community. And whereas the arts and humanities help community members explore their diverse history and culture with support and creativity of large, mid-sized and small cultural organizations, creative individuals, educational institutions and local businesses. And whereas the collective nonprofit arts industry of the town of Matthews, surrounding towns, Mecklenburg County and Charlotte strengthens our economy by generating $243 million in total economic activity annually, 21.6 million in state and local government revenue and by supporting the full-time equivalent of 7,600 jobs. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that I, John F. Higdon, Mayor of the Town of Matthews, do hereby proclaim October as National Arts and Humanities Month in Matthews, North Carolina, and call upon our community members to celebrate arts and culture 
and to join in this special observance. In witness whereof I hear, have hereunto set my hand and caused to be affixed the great seal of the town of Matthews on this 11th day of October, 2021. And uh, I would like to uh, virtually present this proclamation to Mayor Pro Tem Garner, who is our Arts and Science Council representative. Renee, would you like to say a few words? I would. Um, so thank you, Mayor, and thank you, fellow commissioners, for presenting this tonight. Uh, I, for those who don't know, I uh, serve as the uh, one of the Matthews residents representing the Southeast Advisory Board for the Arts and Science Council, along with artist Jennifer Stone Carroll. Um, and I also serve on the board of directors for ASC, representing the southern towns of Matthews, Mint Hill, and Pineville. So on behalf of the artists, arts and cultural organizations, businesses, educators, and residents of Matthews that benefit from our town's support of ASC. Thank you for taking the time to recognize National Arts Humanities Month. As Matthews joins this collective recognition of the importance of culture, we are reminded of the power of the arts to bring us together and celebrate our common humanity. Thank you. And happy National Arts and Humanities Month. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. It's certainly uh, true that uh, the arts and uh, have really uh, raised our spirits during these difficult times, for sure. I'd like to move on to item number five, receive a COVID-19 update from Chief Rob Kennenberg. Chief, sorry, I didn't introduce you earlier. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Town Council. Um, so this report's based on data uh, from the county on uh, October 6th. Um, on October 6th, we had ha experienced 152,000 cases with 1,205 deaths countywide. Uh, we have seen a slow decline in the number of reported cases since late August, but with a uh, case rate of 181 cases per 100 B in substantial community spread. Uh, October 6th, the seven day new case count was 288 and the positivity rate, as I said, was 8.8. .8. Um, important point, only laboratory confirmed PCR tests, uh, not rapid tests, uh, are included in the report data. Therefore, it is estimated that the true burden of COVID in the community is underrepresent, up underrepresented. Um, those who are asymptomatic simply are not getting tested. Uh, hospital census was 288 on the 6th, down from a high of 440 in August. Uh, new cases over the past two weeks tend to be among females in the 25 to 39 year old age demographic. Uh, over 50% of new cases are among 18 to 49 year olds with those under 18 making up 29% and those over 50 making up 20%. 60% um, of Mecklenburg County residents are partially vaccinated and 56% fully vaccinated. That's an increase of only 1% in each category over the last two weeks. Uh, the CDC has recommended booster shots for everyone over 65 and forward facing critical workers. Um, that ends my report. I'll entertain any questions you might have. We have any questions? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate the update. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Let's get item six. Uh, do we have anything to be added to the agenda? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Now we'll move on to seven public comment. Uh, so new starting with this meeting, people will be able to comment without registering in advance. Actually, it's been a couple meetings now. Um, we are allowing people to make comments uh, when appropriate without registering in advance. There will be allowed only during the public comment and public hearing items. So we'll see if anybody uh, wishes to do that. You may now indicate your desire to make a public comment by using Zoom's raise hand feature. Or if you're on a, des if you're on a desktop or mobile device, click raise hand and the webinar controls, and you'll be recognized by the name listed in your Zoom window to your telephone number. Once you're called on, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera. Lori will call on people by name and number. 
So, uh, Lori, do we have anybody pre-registered or not pre-registered that would like to comment? Uh, we don't have anyone pre-registered. We do have one person who has raised their hand, and I'll bring them over. It's Bob Fessler. Uh, Mr. Fessler did um, inform us that he wanted to speak on one of our public hearing items. So I just want to be sure that uh, there's not some confusion on that. Mr. Fessler, once you're able to speak, can you just clarify if you wanted to talk about something other than the public hearing that's coming up later on the agenda? You'll need to unmute yourself, sir, and turn your camera on if you have one available. Yes, sir, thank my you. apologies, I did want to speak on the Eastern Gateway improvement, so I will okay. put my hand. Not a problem, we'll, we will get to that item uh, shortly. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lori, no one else? I do not see anyone else, sir. Okay, thank you, Lori. We'll go on to agenda item eight, recess the regular meeting for public hearings on applications to amend the United Unified Development Ordinance and Land Use Map of the Town of Matthews. I would entertain that motion. I so move. Second. Motion from Commissioner Whitley, a second from Commissioner McCool. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. I vote yes. So uh, we are now uh, in a public hearing. Uh, Jay, can you please introduce the planning board members in attendance? Sure. We have uh, confirmed in attendance uh, our vice chair, Natasha Edwards. Uh, I believe Howie Labner, Jim Johnson, Mike Rowan. I think that's everyone I saw on the attendee list. We'll see who else pops up here. that it? I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, once again, I always uh, like to thank the planning board for their uh, volunteer service to the town. Uh, we'll move on uh, to item 8A, zoning application 2021-737, Mount Harmony Cottages, to change the zoning from R15 to R9CD on that certain property designated as 25 <laughs> Mount Harmony Church Road and further designated as tax parcel 215-12307. Mr. Will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, council members. Um, so tonight we have a rezoning from R15 to R9CD. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, we'll go through the presentation. There we go. And um, as the mayor said, this is uh, application 2021-737. Um, the location is 2700 Mount Harmony Church Road. Um, the existing zoning, as I mentioned before, is R15. The proposed zoning is R9 CD conditional. Um, the applicant proposes to change the zoning of the property from R15 to R9 conditional for the purpose of constructing 17 single family residences. This is the, an aerial photograph. Um, as you can see, the um, parcel is existing. Here's a street view. Some small scrub pines on the edge and some bigger pines. And so, um, it's 6.2 A1 acres. Directly to the south is a single family residence. Um, and to the north is Lake Harmony Estates, which is a single family subdivision. Across Mount Harmony Church Road uh, from the site is a large lot, single family residence, and also a vacant tract. No previous zoning actions have been taken on this parcel. The proposed site plan is stormwater management is to be um, maintained on site. The proposed road is um, 56 feet um, of right of way. Um, we've got a unit count of 2.7 unit lot area will be 9,000 square feet, hence the R9 um, zoning designation. And Lake Harmony Drive will be extended um, through this parcel for access. Um, some of the proposed conditions 
that the applicant is asking for is um, vinyl ephus and uh, masonite shall not be used as exterior building materials. Each dwelling unit shall have a front porch. Um, the dwelling units located on the same side of the street and um, adjacent to one another will not have the same elevation design. And the driveways for lots one and seven, excuse me, one and 17, which are the two lots that are by Mount Harmony Church Road, their driveways will be um, on the opposite side from Mount Harmony Church Road. These are some of the conceptual elevations that the applicant is proposing. As you can see, the double car garage uh, is divided into two single, single garage doors. Um, front porch, uh, at least six feet in depth. Uh, we have a summary of school impacts from CMS. Um, they estimate this development may add nine students to the schools in the area. Um, their recommendation was um, they're particularly concerned about a case where school utilization exceeds 100%, which we have here in Mint Hill Middle and Butler High. Um, some of the land use adopted policies um, are that it considers well-designed infill development such as R9 and higher density mixed uh, provide a variety of housing styles, densities, and locations. Encourage design and construction of alternative style housing developments. Um, so the proposed change in zoning from R15 to R9 is generally standing issues. Um, tree save in the southern corner of the parcel was, current, was vacant and they're first looked at having tree save in another area of their development. Um, they have dedicated 56 feet of right of way, dri uh, driveway lot away from the main entrance. And they are going to look at relocating the utility line that goes through parcels one and 16. Stop sharing my screen. Um, I believe the applicant is here, um, but I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, and yes, the applicants do have a presentation to give. Rob, I would suggest let's let the applicant do their presentation and let's save all questions. All right, who's gonna speak on behalf of the applicants? Hi all, this is Maggie Watts with Urban Design Partners. I believe that you all were gonna run the presentation for us. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Okay, Maggie, I will. Don't have too much more to add from what Rob has already gone over. So this, this shouldn't take long, but again, 2700 Mount Harmony Church Road. Next slide. And just a larger context uh, aerial to get our bearings very similar to what Rob showed. Next slide. And we had our um, density illustrated here as well as a couple of the neighboring single family development densities. Our current proposed rezoning plan. Next slide. And this is just those lots overlaid on a vegetation um, trees, I believe six inches and greater. So it's not reflective of all the trees out there. Next slide. And rendering to give you guys a hopefully a little better visual of what the buildable envelopes will look like on the 17 lots. Next slide. Again, the conceptual elevations. And I believe that might be the final slide. And that is all we have for you all for presentation. So we're happy to answer questions as well. Uh, I'm uh, general locations or um, amount? Both, because it looks Both. pretty sparse. <laughs> Both. Um, no. Jake, can we go back to the site plan? It's a little hard to see, um, but you can see plan north. There's a buffer, a buffer area that's tree save in between 
um, the neighboring development and this proposed that is going to be a swath of tree save. There's also a section along 485 behind lots eight, nine, and 10. Um, there's another section right there at the um, turn in the proposed Lake Harmony Drive and another section in um, kind of this, there's not many trees behind 12 and 13. So we um, increased the width of the tree save, but now it's only behind uh, 14 through 17. Okay, do we have any uh, questions from the elected officials? Um, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Um, I have a question for Rob about the, the schools. Um, two of them were over 100%. Does that are um, approved but haven't started construction yet? That's a great question. Um, and I am not exactly sure. Those are given to us by the school system. Um, so I'm not sure what they take into account. If, um, But we do ask um, at each rezoning um, for a school impact statement. So they should have database of the existing and the proposed. I think it typically shows enrollment as of the beginning of the school year on the report, somewhere on that report. Yes. Okay. I just went back and looked at it. It is, um, it does say following data is as of the, so it's sort of a, it's a point in time. And do we, as a, as a percentage over is of um, including things that we've already approved? Yeah, so we do have a database uh, of using, I mean, and, and these are all estimates, right? So it's, it's tough to lay estimate upon estimate because we don't know who the buyers are going to be. But it, I mean, it's a fair point that there, there are some approved projects. The, the elementary school will be fine with the new relief school coming, but I would like to know about the middle school and the high school particularly. Yeah, we can provide that to you. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. On the Stub Street connection to Lake Harmony Drive uh, above you on the map, uh, has there been any pushback? I'm glad that there's some connectivity there. It's a nice development, but have, has there been any objection to that at all? Um, no, we actually had a um, really great community meeting and I believe all of the attendees, um, almost all of them were from that development. Uh, what they were interested in is that we try and keep um, maybe the st same street tree uh, rhythm and kind of help um, you know, mesh those developments together so that they don't look singular. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Urban. Hi, uh, evening Maggie, a uh, couple questions. Let's start with a minor technical one. Under conditions note number two, um, are you, you indicate vinyl ephus and masonite. How much we consider masonite today is a cementitious product like hardy plank, is that, is that what you're trying to clarify? I believe it was, John, but we could um, we can update that to be a little more current with the language. So I'm like, wow, if you're not building with any of these things, what are you using all brick? And so um, maybe, maybe some clarification there, that'd be fine. Okay. The second thing is um, the Kinger Homes, is this the group that finished the 10 houses on Tanfield? Um, I believe the applicant is here. He might need to answer that question. I'm not sure. Okay. And then the follow-up to that is, um, are they the ones also that are further down on Rice Road um, that were scheduled to build next to Mr. Hood on Rice Road? So that they, they have a track record they've built in here before, but that was an approved project that has never been developed. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, maybe they can respond to why that hasn't developed um, and, and is it quite possible that we approve the zoning and it sits idle for some time? Um, so we'll, we can come back to that one. Then, then kind of to the mayor's point, um, the board has talked about this incessantly, and I think you can still mesh this with the other neighborhood, but I think we need to look at a little bit different strategy on the tree save aspects of these things. Um, can, you, can you look at doing a heavier buffer on the front 
two homes um so you get more of a nice green street edge or can you look at losing lot number 11 to having some type of amenity uh and spreading the, the tree save around at the same time um your tree survey points out a lot of nice trees maybe not necessarily as large as you may expect but um you know working these home plans pushing and pulling don't line them up uh, in order that you might be able to save more trees on the property so I think this is a case in point where you can really work it here um, to improve the overall sort of green look of the project, um, yet get it to fit in. So that, that's my highlighted comment. I'm very familiar with their elevations because if they did do tan field and then the project next to Mr. Hood, um, I, I've seen these before and I think you could just drive down tan field to see the level of quality of the product. So my, my big conversation tonight is really sort of pushing uh, tree save, pushing how you can utilize green space a little bit better and not just give us the status quo of holding the edges with some trees. Okay, thank you. Commissioner McCool, do we have an idea on price point for, uh, for these units? Um, Maggie, this is Paul Sagan and I can jump in here. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, first in reference uh, on, on John's question, in reference to the rice um, production, just you know, we are we are breaking ground on that in November. Um, we have a lot of work to do on the stream and getting that approved and crossing that. And that probably took a good six, eight, 10 months longer than we expected. But we'll start breaking ground on that in, in November. So that one's coming right behind us. And then uh, Ken, just in reference to your question, where I mean, market it will di dictate when we when we start building this, but our, our projected is probably. Uh, anywhere starting in the low mid fours into the low lower fives is probably a projected we're thinking maybe like 20, 2800 to 3600 on the square footage and um, and uh, all single family. And then uh, a follow up question kind of going back to the trees we, we really love trees on this board. Uh, are you planning on doing any significant replant in some areas where you will have to take tree de trees down or on the roads and if so, will those be native species? So grading and clearing dictates a bit of that. Obviously, you know, once we get out there and, and get a real lay of the land, but you know, we want to keep trees on there as well. Um, the other side of it, that Lake Harmony is, is pretty barren. I think that got pretty clear cut. So we're trying to do a good job with keeping some buffer trees in between them and us. And we can certainly look at the potential to do some native species planting uh, to, to improve some of the space. Thank you. Any other questions from the elected board? Uh, Commissioner Urban. And just to follow up, Paul, um, like I said, it would be nice to have a buffer uh, along the front of the property between one and 12. If, if, you, if you decide you don't want to do a buffer, I'd want to see side elevations of those homes because um, that's pretty uh, important presentation to the street edge. So you, you can sort of debate how you want to treat that from that standpoint. Yes, sir. Thank you. And as a, as a further comment to Commissioner Urban, uh, I, I believe this board would like to see uh, some specific uh, commitment to what you are going to save. Uh, we've been burned a few times in the past where developers have said, well, we're going to try to save this or that. And they said, well, we couldn't. Sorry. So <laughs> we could get some, uh, some commitment to uh, those tree save areas. We would really appreciate it. Does anybody on the planning board have any uh, comments or questions? Please uh, speak up. Not seeing any. Uh, Lori, has uh, anybody raised their hand in the Zoom to indicate they would like to uh, speak on this? Uh, no, sir, but if you don't mind giving those instructions again. Sure, anyone in the Zoom audience uh, can make comments now. Um, they can use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you're on a desktop or mobile device, click raise hand. In the webinar controls, you'll be recognized by the name listed in your Zoom window. If you've joined by telephone, you can dial star nine and you'll be recognized by your phone number. Once you're called on, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera if you have one and state your name for the record and make your comment. It appears we do not have anyone wishing to make a comment at this time. Okay, I uh, 
Appreciate the presentations tonight. This application will be heard by the planning board on October 26th and come back to our board on November 8th, 2021. So thank you. Thank you. Move on to the next item, motion 2021-3 text to amend the existing UDO text regarding public improvement standards, including transportation impact analysis, accessibility standards, compliance with other adopted transportation plans and further aspects of the physical development of the town. Mr. Will and Susan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is gonna be a, this has been a team effort. Um, we're going to go through a brief presentation with you all about some of the changes that we are, the staff has proposed for chapter seven uh, of the UDO. I'm gonna bring up my share screen. So our proposal is um, basically revisions to the public improvement standards of chapter seven, which is um, in the UDO. Um, and why, so why are we doing this now? Um, well, updates have to, to the chapter have been needed for a while. Um, we have seen a recent surge in land development activity, as everyone is aware, and staff has realized there are many standards and requirements in Chapter 7 that really need to be updated in order to keep up with the uh, um, to Chapter 7 since the UDO was adopted in 2014. So it is about time. Um, so where did, how did we come up with the proposed changes that we're gonna share with you tonight from, from um, Davidson, Huntersville, Mooresville, Cornelius and Stylings, um, you know, surrounding municipalities. We consult studies for clients. We spoke with staff from various municipalities about, the traffic in their, about their traffic impact analysis experience. We discussed some proposed changes with Luisa don't worry, I'll go over, or we'll, we'll, Susan and I will go over what PROAG is. It's another government acronym, but we'll explain that in here in a second. And we also got comments from town public work staff and planning staff. So the next couple slides are, we're just gonna go over um, sort of high level summary of changes. The updated, um, the first change that we made is the updated nomenclature. Um, some of the names still um, referred to as sea mud and um, some drainage references, we updated those as well. Um, we strengthened the ordinance language for vulnerable modes. So by references to bicycle transit sidewalks, um, uh, in the code, which was which was our standard practice, um, we added references to the Mecklenburg County our standards for all greenways to be dedicated to the public are similar to that in Mecklenburg County. Um, conformance with adopted plans. This was a this was a good big change, um, or a. We included dedication of right of way when shown on other adopted plans and along the silver line. Um, so, and those things um, are to be reserved. Um, the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Susan because these are some engineer issues that we uh, worked on. Thanks, Rob. And uh, hearing, and um, it was many months of work for just a couple slides of information. So thank you, Rob, for going on this this journey and helping me through the public hearing process as well. First bullet on this slide: um, we first looked at our TIA process because we knew that would be the biggest change out of Chapter Seven, as you saw in your packet. Uh, we kept the intro part to the TIA ordinance and revamped everything else. Uh, because really it didn't provide a lot of guidance to developers or engineers on what the requirements were. Uh, noticeable differences are the developer review fees and their um, pre-qualified consultant selection, uh, as well as the mit mitigation re requirements. Um, we did simplify the bike pet analy analyses have been expanded to also include crash and safety analysis. 
uh, how we did our ordinance and the accompanying policy document, which is in your packet, is that we stitched together all of our favorite sections from the other ordinances and manuals um, from the municipalities that Rob mentioned. The next bullet um, reflecting current issues with state funding is included with the TIA, um, but also elsewhere in the UDO, look, we just feel like we can no longer say, oh, the state will fix that. Oh, don't worry about that. The state's coming through with a project. We've seen what happens and we don't want to put the town in a situation in the future where we say, oh, well, that's part of U2509. When's it gonna get built? Oh, the, the issue would be at the point where they're, they're building their development, right? We don't want we, uh, there to be this congestion and this difficult situation in the interim. And so, um, not, and not just with state projects, but also it could be developer projects. It could be, it doesn't, ends up not being done. Uh, update to um, keep consistent with current practice and new state laws. There was a whole slew of events that people agree to do, but we just like to strengthen the position of that. Um, the routine, we don't do that, it's on the HOA. Um, a site triangle legislation just came, it fixed our ordinance so that it you know, was measured from the right of way. Now it's measured from the edge of pavement. We wanna be consistent with the law, um, but also we, we encourage. Um, Alley approval, just adding you know, upon um, agreement by Public Works. We, we fixed some really extreme uh, uh, specifying that we do require 30 inch curb and gutter on our streets and is above the curb. People like to feel like they're kind of above the street instead of walking underneath the street. Um, and also I added you know, some technical stuff like sawing construction joints on 10 foot wide sidewalks. Rob mentioned ProWag. That is the public rights of way accessibility guidelines. And we added that uh, to the ordinance. These guidelines ensure that pedestrians using the right of way are accommodated. Um, and we use verbiage provided by Mecklenburg County for that. So it's, it's standard verbiage, but we wanna make sure that developers and designers know that the expectation is that they would turn to PROAG uh, for guidance on ADA and the right of way. The driveway permit requirement, um, again, keeping conformance to what we currently do, our, our construction standard, it talks about our construction standards and our standard details show hard surface in the right of way, but the UDO didn't specifically spell it out. And we also added that hard surface to five foot. Um, it says back a curb here. I didn't catch that. That's a typo, sorry, back of sidewalk. Um, because have you ever walked on the sidewalk and that gravel has like mounded itself over the sidewalk and you just want to kick it out of the way. So by paving it five feet and people, it doesn't add a ton of cost to their driveway project if they do it five feet back of the sidewalk. And then um, lastly, UDO chapter seven changes. Um, two items among others that could be added are the traffic calming matrix which is basically um, a compilation of all the tools available to us uh, for traffic calming methods. These um, were compiled by other, what other municipalities use. Um, and that we also added traffic calming in, in a couple other locations in the UDO for developments, like when connecting to an adjacent neighborhood, or if there's a really long straightaway, 500 feet of a straight tangent section of road that the developer includes traffic calming. We've seen that recently in recent rezonings. And then the other one would be the sidewalk matrix. Um, that would be incorporated into our standard details, um, but also the right-of-way width, which are right on the first page of the edits that, we, that were in your packet. Um, they have to be increased for both the planting strip at eight shots of what those two design resources would look like. And I do want to note that um, we did, um, based off of last month's presentation, we did add six foot wide for all of those class six residential streets. Um, including that large lot single family and then eight foot for that multifamily. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Susan. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, our next steps will be to receive comments now at the public hearing um, and then incorporate any of those changes and, and then we will bring, um, bring it back to the town board in November for a final decision. And then of course, we will continue to update administrative processes based on the final adoption um, 
that so the the fun doesn't stop with the town board it'll it um it will continue on with staff um to so that is the presentation on chapter seven changes happy to answer any questions that the board may have at this time okay commissioner miller Thank you. Just a, a general question on the um, hard surface for driveways five feet back of sidewalk. There may be some gravel side uh, gravel driveways rather within the town limits of Matthews. Would they be grandfathered in until they substantially change the footprint or square footage? That's correct. So that requirement would be, would be specific to driveway permits. So when you get a new permit, that requirement would be enforced at that time. All right. Thank you. Let me open this up to questions from, from anyone on the planning board or the town board. Any questions, comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Maybe I missed this in the presentation, but has TAC seen this or discussed this yet? Do you do a chapter seven changes now? Would they have a chance to discuss it? I'm sure, I mean, the matrix on um, traffic. Very interested in traffic calming. They are the <clears> ones that initiated that because they are, they said they're tired of approving speed humps and they want other options. And so a consultant came in and compiled the matrix, but what needs to um, be updated really is the tra a traffic calming policy. And that is what they will see either this month or next month. I don't remember when I have it on the schedule. Um, and so that will be separate. You'll see that like the town implementing traffic calming will be another time. So this matrix is really just a compilation of tools available for when the traffic calming um, requirement kicks in for the UDO. It's like, oh, all this stuff is so expensive. I said, well, when you build it along with the road, it's not as expensive. It's expensive to us because we got to go back out and tear out curves and stuff. So they were they were appreciative of the word helpful as to when, when certain things would um, apply. And the TAC had some comments about the organization of it to be more intuitive. So there's intersection treatments and segment treatments. So they have seen it. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from the planning board or the town board? Not seeing or hearing any, I wanna thank uh, Rob and Susan for keeping us up to date. I was talking to a colleague in my day job recently, and uh, he was talking about a major metropolitan city that will remain nameless. And many of their regulations are like 25 years old and totally out of date. And he just was saying how it was so embarrassing uh, to have some, some folks read their regulations and realize how out of date they were. So I appreciate you guys uh, staying on top of it and making a thing. Uh, it's good to have all that things as simple as that updated, I think makes us look like we're on top of our game. So we appreciate your attention to detail there. Um, Go and sign up in advance. Well, I'm gonna read this thrilling paragraph once again for anybody in the audience, but anyone in the Zoom audience can make comments uh, by raising their hand using the raise your hand feature in Zoom. If you're a desktop or mobile device, click your raise hand in the webinar controls and you will be recognized by the name listed in your Zoom window. If you have joined by phone, dial star nine. You'll be recognized by the phone number. State your name for the record. Lori, do we have any people that have taken this No, item? sir, we do not. All right. Well, seeing no more questions for our board on November 8th. So thank you, Rob and Susan, appreciate it. The Eastern Gateway Small Area Plan, an area approximately 120 acres bounded by I-485, Ottawa Road, and the Woodrow neighborhood, plan will examine existing conditions and infrastructure and provide recommendations to help guide future land use decisions. <clears throat> and Nadine Bennett will present this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to start by saying I know that a lot of you have heard this before, um, but I'm going to go through it anyway because I'm sure there's some people in the audience who haven't heard it. Um, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the document before we get to the recommend. Pretty quickly when we got into the to the study, we limited we limited it and a lot of them were dependent on working with NCDOT um, during the, the design of the roundabout. That's not gonna happen anymore, but a lot of those recommendations, uh, there are buffers, there are swim buffers that would uh, 
well, they preclude development right there. Just in general, Matthew's trends, and you've seen this before, I know, um, population is increasing. Uh, fewer households have children under 18, so traditional families aren't, aren't the main buyers right now. The population 65 plus is increasing. The housing prices are going up. So for the planning process, uh, we did want to get out there and talk to people about this area. Obviously, we didn't just want to make decisions on our own. So we started or we only want single family housing. But again, we got more responses that supported all different kinds of schedules. We sent out a notice in the mail to people within a third and they put signs up in the neighborhood as well. We had about a hundred people come through and a lot of the comments, uh, I would say the biggest concerns are about traffic and mixed use with commercial and you've got the single family lots and they're smaller lots there, but they all surround a green, um, which I thought was great. And then just so you know that this isn't just outside of Matthews that it's happening, it's also happening in Matthews. And that's with the North End, which um, I've heard a lot of people say it's one of their favorite places in Matthews. Um, and it has townhomes and it has um, has commercial, um, it has places to gather. It's got, it's got seating right there. And it didn't happen all at once. This is actually one that came in little by little. Um, and as Jay explained it, it's, it, became a neighborhood. It might not have started that way, but it really became kind of a neighborhood. Yes. For um, rental trends, uh, again, I've, I've gone over this before, but there are um, non-traditional renters out there now. Uh, there are people who just don't want to be tied down to a house. Um, even more importantly, probably there are people who can't afford a mortgage right now and they're renting instead. So people who didn't used to rent are now renting. And another uh, big trend in renting is a build to rent community. And we've got this in the plan because we had a number of calls for this area specifically for build to rent communities. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. And it's in here. Um, so one important thing we think for this area and what a lot of people are also talking about now is having a sense of place. People talk about the character of an area, they talk about the character of Matthews, and really what they're talking about is that sense of place that they have, a sense of belonging to the community. And there are ways that you can do that in a new community to, to strive for that sense of place. Um, got a list of things here, but the public realm is also, it's really important for sense of place. And that's your architectural building design, and those are kind of the walls of your space, public art, street furniture, green spaces, street trees, and the types of public streets that you have. It all contributes to making you feel at home in a community and welcome in a community. Now these came, this, is, this relates very well to your last presentation. These came straight from, um, from public works. These for pedestrian safety, you talk about a walkable community, you definitely want people to be able to walk there or bike there. Um, and these are some of the things that Susan was talking about, the um, traffic calming devices, but it's just a little explanation of each. And these are the ones that they suggested and a picture of each too. And some of these are already happening in Matthews, some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and just more down here, there's a, the bulb outs in downtown. Uh, this is a diverging diamond interchange, which I didn't really know anything about until recently. Um, but apparently the 485 interchange that they're going to the reconstruct is going to be a diverging diamond. And there are ways to make that uh, safer for pedestrians. And I myself wouldn't have believed it until I actually walked on this one in Cornelius. And I, we just stopped halfway across the interchange and we're just kind of standing there talking with traffic going by on either side and it felt perfectly comfortable. Um, lots of questions also about the environment in the area. So now for the recommendations, the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, again, it's not that different from what was um, juiced there. And we, again, we cut out that connection and I'll get back to more of that later. Um, but this is single family here. This would be townhomes or um, duplexes. And we felt it was important to have a variety of housing styles and housing, housing choices there for people in different stages of life. Um, and it is, when you have mixed use, you need a bit of density. So that's another explanation of that. Got some uh, site-specific recommendations here. Uh, so a lot of concern about traffic on Idlewild Road when we talk to people in the community. 
Uh, one of the first things that we did was talk to NCDOT about the possibility of a traffic signal. And they told us that the probably the closest that they were not probably definitely the closest that they would get to the ones at 485 are at Davis Trace. We were making a suggestion for a traffic signal there. We think that the non-residential uses should be internally focused and not on up to Idlewild Road because it's maybe not the kind of road that you want to be, you know, sitting out on having your um, your coffee. It's, it's kind of a busy road. Really important to this is the central gathering place. And again, that gives a feeling of community. It gives kind of people an ownership of the area. Um, the high quality pedestrian crossings at strategic locations. And I've got, you know, I've got them kind of scattered throughout, but this is something that would be determined during the development process. And luckily we're going to have updated regulations that can, um, you know, talk to these things. Uh, we'll see water quality buffers here, important. Um, pedestrian access to Creekside. And this is an important one. Um, again, the neighbors did not want uh, the connection to go through to Creekside. And we are not recommending uh, a connection to Creekside right now. We did think that possibly decades into the future, there might be a time when the neighborhood itself might want that connection. If this is a su successful neighborhood, maybe they'll be thinking, I don't want to get out onto Idlewild Road to get there. I would like to go through it. Um, so we, on this plan, we show it as being as being the potential at some point to connect. And I know that there is a lot of concern still in the neighborhood about even the potential of a connection. So again, I want to say this would be decades into the future and something that would be only done with neighborhood support. So also recommendations from the Stevens Creek sub area study should be followed. And then a mention of the diverging diamond there and that making that pedestrian friendly and also that there should be a substantial buffer there along um, 485. And these are some general recommendations that we are actually still working on. Um, we really wanted to focus on the feel of the area. Um, so again, talking a lot about a sense of place and what goes into a sense of place. Um, and those are those suggestions for housing, different types of housing um, for from single family attached to single family detached, to apartments. And that's so people in all kinds of stages of life can possibly live there. We really think it's important to have single story homes because a lot of people mentioned that, that you know, if they wanna retire there, um, they just want one floor. And there are other people who don't need two floors. So it's important to have the one story. Um, a wide variety of price points. And we should have, developers should consider setting aside a certain percentage, and I don't have that percentage of homes for workforce housing or affordable housing. Um, we also think it would be good to have residential units above some of the retail where it's appropriate. And it, that it should be a mix of rentals and for sale units. Um, so not entirely rental, and again, not entirely for sale. For mobility and infrastructure, uh, we talk about streets. And I want to say again that this. Uh, anything about the traffic, anything about streets would go through, this would all have to go through a rezoning before anything happened. And we've got these uh, better, better rules now on um, what happens in the traffic impact analysis, and that would apply here. Um, we want the developers to coordinate site plans uh, so that they flow and so that the infrastructure is available. And again, environmental concerns were big at the meetings. And any, de any development would have to meet the stormwater detention regulations, but we think they should consider low impact development. Water quality or the land and the water quality buffers should be preserved in natural state. Integrate open space throughout the area and that there should be a substantial tree save in the area. And again, don't have a number on that, um, but we are still kind of fleshing out some of these recommendations. So this, this is really hot off the presses. Um, we had an, an artist actually take a look at the site plan and give us a rendering of what it could look like. And we will call back to this as we make more recommendations about architecture in the area as well. And again, this is a concept drawing. We understand that it's not gonna come out just like this. It's gonna go through a process, you're gonna review it, but this is something that could happen there. The public square, with Public Art Incorporated. You've got your wide sidewalks, you've got your street seating, you've got people sitting outside at restaurants, which uh, 
respondents really seem drawn to the idea of sitting outside at restaurants. And I think that's probably because of the time that we're in right now. Um, one more, uh, this would be the green area back here. We have an area, a pretty substantial area of tree save that leads back to the next neighborhood and that would be the pedestrian connection there. And again, there would be um, residential on either side. So the appendix is again, just the kind of a, a fleshed out uh, responses to the community input. And that's what I've got. And I think you're probably gonna get a few people raising their hands on this one to speak. <laughs> Thank you, um, Nadine. Can, can uh, Jay, can you return to the gallery view? <clears throat> I'd like to uh, start with a, a few comments on my own. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not surprised you got a lot of commentary from, from Woodrow uh, neighborhood because they uh, <laughs> are perhaps one of the more outspoken neighborhoods. We appreciate uh, their viewpoints, but they, they always uh, rally around the cause to this uh, interesting neighborhood. Um, a couple of questions. You mentioned the diverging diamond. Maybe I, I see Susan is still on. Which which uh, intersection on 45 is a diverging diamond in Matthews? I didn't think we had any. It's proposed for the Idlewild interchange. That's oh, part of that, the Idlewild okay. plans. Okay. Yeah, and okay. so, um, yeah, as so Dan, one of the first things Dana and I did when she started was we went up to Cornelius and walked the one that's up in Cornelius. And so then she took the planning department here recently to have them experience it so that everyone could become familiar with it. And, and I highly recommend it. It's, you can, you can like grab your milkshake at McDonald's and, and walk across the highway. And it's, a, it's an interesting experience. And when we were there, we saw, we saw plenty of people walking across it and biking across it too. I, I found that surprising, but they were there. Yeah, I, rem I remember Susan, you guys were advocating for that at John Street, but they wouldn't do it, isn't that correct? One of the, um, there was a consultant that had suggested it. And since we enjoyed the one at Cornelius, we thought, sure, we can support this concept if the DOT will change their mind because the loops, it's a big interchange at John Street. Um, just another comment I have is I've, I've been to uh, Baxter Village in Fort Mill several times and you talk to the people that live there, they love it. I mean, it's just a really popular place and you see that, and I, and I, demographic across every range you can think of, of, of ages and everything. And it just, uh, it's just, it's a higher density concept, but it's something that people seem to really like that live there. The question I had was uh, based on this plan, what portion uh, of this product that would be there would be inventory that would be sold versus rented? Cause it looks like it's heavily uh, weighted towards rental. Um, I think that's something that would probably evolve over the development process. Um, I would say that uh, we do have single family there and the townhomes and the duplexes, I would assume many of those would also be for sale product. Um, so I think it's maybe a pretty even split right now. Okay. But until we get proposals, we won't know specifically. Sure. The, we can make the recommendations. Feedback, the feedback this board is getting, at least I'm getting, and I think everybody else is, is that we'd like to see more for sale product built in Matthews. All right, I'll shut up. Who, who has a, a comment or, or a question on the town board or the planning board? Uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Nadine, um, adjacent to the Windrow subdivision would be single family, is that correct? And, that is correct. And what? Uh, how many feet of buffer? Undisturbed buffer. Um, Jay or Susan, do you know what the swim buffer is, what they require? I believe it's 50 if it's residential to residential. I just kind of wanted to confirm or question. They're variable uh, depending upon the, the stream or creek or tributary that they're along. Sometimes 30 feet on either side of the center line, but it, it depends. Um, Nadine, we can go back and look at that and see if we can come up with a general um, buffer, but I, I feel like it was pretty substantial just due to the natural areas that, that backed up to the Windrow community. Okay. 
You want me to show the actual buffers? Yeah. And these are from the um, these are from uh, Mecklenburg County GIS showing the buffers. Maybe that's something we could clarify uh, before the next uh, discussion. Uh, we'll do that. I'm not as concerned about traffic when you're already at the intersection of 485 and Idlewild Road. Um, you know, a, a majority of people will either just hop on 485 to get where they're going and um, that's not a concern of mine, but I understand it's been a concern of others. I, I would like to share, I think most of the board seen this, but for the public as a courtesy to my uh, mayoral colleague, Wyatt Dunn, the mayor of Stallings has uh, written an email saying that uh, he did not approve of the small area plan at the corner of Ottawa and 45 because of the high density housing and lack of infrastructure to handle the increased traffic. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Yeah, I'd just like to um, thank Nadine and everybody who participated on this. I, I think if the, the older guard on the board remembers not maybe four or six years ago, um, several petitioners looking at multifamily on this site were, were quickly rebuffed. Um, I'm pleased to see sort of a compromised position here layering the site from single family to a detached uh, multifamily to multifamily. And, and this is just a policy statement. This is just a plan, as we all know with the sportsplex, um, that plan changes over time, but I think this is a good start. And I think to Jeff Miller's point, if you create a neighborhood that has services, laundry, uh, uh, you know, small restaurants or local cafes or stuff like that, those folks will not have to get in their automobiles to go to Wyatt's town. Um, the infrastructure will not be burdened as much if you have the live, work, play concept in that community situation. So it's greatly reduced from that aspect of it. And plus the fact that it's right near 485 makes a lot of sense. So I, I do commend at this stage in the game, the, the, the thoughtfulness of the presentation, um, the layout. Obviously it'll be morphed and changed over time, but I think um, you're seeing that this is more the wave of the future. We can debate for sale versus rental. Um, it's a marketplace piece, but uh, I, I think what they've done is a really good uh, start here at this location. Agree. Yeah, it is a, a very comprehensive report and, and we appreciate that. Uh, to Commissioner Urban's uh, point, I hear that comment about not getting in your automobile from a lot of the my younger friends that live at South End. Mm -hmm. They go home on Friday afternoon and park their car and they don't get in it again till, till Monday. So yeah. uh, everything they need is there from restaurants to church, to post office, to dry cleaner, they, they can walk to everything. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any other comments from the elected board or the planning board? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. As we're talking about that live, work, play concept, I think we need, do need to make sure there's an emphasis on affordability so that the people who are working in these service industry jobs can afford to walk to work as well. And I think that's a statement that we could probably strengthen in there. Great, that would be great. Good point, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, we do have a, a couple of folks that have signed up as uh, to comment. Uh, Lori, would you like to introduce them? Yes, we do have Bob Fessler, who is commenter number one, and then Keith McVane and some others in his group will be commenter number two, and then we can go to anyone who wishes to make a live comment after that. So Mr. Fessler, if you can turn your camera on, turn your mic on, and you are good to go. All right, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to um, address this board and this proposition. Um, so I'm Bob Fessler. I live at 3201 Windrow Lane. Um, and I've been directly involved with Nadine Bennett and the Eastern Gateway Committee um, 
However, I'm feeling a, a little bit disjointed, even though Nadine has presented a very comprehensive end-to-end -end view of all of this, and even from the comments that I hear from people to support the, the project, the overall concern is really a couple of things. One, the traffic, and two, adding any more apartments into this area. So I think uh, Mayor Higdon, you uh, addressed a concern there about, you know, you'd like to see more buy than rent. Um, that has been the overwhelming concern of the community. And I am reading from a script, so my apologies if I look away. Um, you know, traditionally the Windrow community sits on the other side of the tracks. In this case, the other side of Independence Boulevard. It's been long been an afterthought for improvements for infrastructure and upper end residential development. I moved into my current house when I was 28 with a six month old and a daughter that shortly came. That was 30 plus years ago. We were told back then by the Matthews Town Council and the DOT that Iowa Road would be widened and sidewalks added to the Union County line. Our concerns back then were very simple, the ability to go on a long walk while pushing our strollers. To date, there is no widening and no sidewalks have arrived as portrayed. There have also been many proposals for development from both Matthews and Mint Hill. We're on the other side of the tracks for Mint Hill as well. Um, which always include high density something, but no infrastructure improvements. These improvements were again proposed around the same time as Purser Farm and the Stevens Creek Nature Preserve, but nothing happened. They were also part of the original concept design uh, of the Eastern Gates Gateway Plan. From my understanding and from listening to Nadine, all of that has been defunded or at least it's on canceled or on hold, which means it will be canceled. Adding, if you're not from the area and you've never lived through a morning or an afternoon in this area, it is not as easy as taking an example of a community that works well in other parts of the state or the United States and plopping it in here. We're already pressed for infrastructure. You cannot turn out onto Ottawild Road basically at any time of the day. I'm a runner walker, you know, unable to cross the road at any time during uh, morning or afternoon rush hours. Up on 485, the reality is not everybody will. If there's any kind of a traffic snag, they'll go left and could in, go into the roundabout at Hood Crossroads, and it's going to add just more general traffic to the area. If those avenues are plugged, they're going to use Windrow as an alternative for a traffic flow like they did when the roundabout was being built, which then wore down our roads so much as you're all aware that you had to come back and resurface our roads because of the wear and tear. So, you know, I'm totally on board, as I said, with some change, but we really need to take into consideration the infrastructure and the roads. Um, even with all of that said, from my perspective, I still support this. Um, I was on board with some of these changes, definitely not anything high density apartments. And like I said, I've been involved with Dean and the Eastern Gateway Committee. When I saw the article published in the Charlotte Weekly, it presented an alternative view of what I saw on the boards from the Windrow event of, of which I am actually pictured. Um, and also um, the prioritization. Um, there really hasn't been any speak of what I can gather on anyone saying they would rather have multi-use anything. They don't want apartments for sure. So any talk of putting in density apartments, that, that at least for us is a non-starter. Obviously you're going to make your own decision. No one has addressed the traffic for years, and why would we think suddenly someone's going to address the, the traffic concern? Putting one light at Davis Trace is really shouldn't even be an option that's being discussed. It's not going to do anything but add another traffic snarl. And the people coming to this area, because they're not all going to be Windrow people, 
or even across the street people, they don't want to get into this traffic either. So you're going to create a traffic concern for both the people coming in here and the Windrow residents. So uh, in summary, uh, in summary, now with no road or infrastructure improvements, the thought of any type of development to snag our roads is not doable for the people coming or going as I referenced. Throw on top of that the option to keep a viable Creekside alternative down the road, even though it's decades, that's decades for this board. Another board or town committee that comes in might have an alternate perspective on what down the road means. Um, and then, you know, in a couple proposals that preceded this, um, proposal A, where we talked about adding nine people to the school systems, and that was going to create an overload. Cre adding as many people that are into this area with even purchase homes, let alone apartments, would absolutely flood those schools. And I would really appreciate a, a study on what that would do to the over. Uh, the overall ability for us to handle not only the students, uh, but the traffic. So I'm hoping that this town council looks also at the spirit and intent of the community feedback. Windrow is a, a very boisterous community. I, I would support that with, with everything, as you know, but not go forward with this plan as written until there's absolutely a solution for the infrastructure that has plagued this area for many decades. Respectfully, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fessler. I, I think you brought up some very uh, valid valid points there. Uh, we go on to the next uh, commenter, uh, Keith. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner, members of the Board of Commissioners, members of the Planning Board. Keith McVeigh with Moore Van Allen, uh, assisting the Ottawa Road investors and Mr. Van Kat. Sir, Sir Yadavara, I'm, I, apologies yes. for pronunciation. No the best I can do. The best I can do. Uh, they're property owners of 15 acres that are within the gateway area, east, east, eastern gateway area plan. Uh, I want to thank uh, Nadine and Jay for their hard work on the plan and uh, keeping us informed of the progress on the plan. It looks like it's a great plan. We, we support a lot of the recommendations of the plan. We are here to, to, to address some of the recommendations uh, and just to offer some thoughts and views that maybe it's, it's a ways to improve the plan. Uh, again, like I said, we are here to support most of the land use recommendations of the Eastern Gateway Plan and to comment a little bit on the the concept plan that's found on page 35 through 39. We support the mix of housing types, but would like to see the plan allow a greater mix of housing types throughout the area if they're well done and well buffered. Um, we support detached single family houses closer to Windrow and the Springwood, Springwater neighborhood, but also would like the plan to consider other housing types as a transition if, again, they can be done well with buffers and open space to create that transition instead of just single-family loud rear yards to single-family loud rear yards. We support the importance of public infrastructure, as the previous speaker had mentioned, and, and you know, the, the public realm, making sure that's well-designed and well thought, thought out. I think the plan makes great recommendations on how to implement that. We support multi-mode multi -mode transportation options, uh, the multi-use paths, the interconnected road network uh, as part of the new developments, uh, wider sidewalks, et cetera. I think Susan talked about some of the new standards that the town is going to implement in that regard. Uh, we support the signal at Davis Trace. I think that will add, even though it does add a, a place for traffic to stop, it hopefully will alleviate, alleviate some congestion by creating some gaps in the traffic. We support the appropriate architecture for the area and architectural details. I think Nadine mentions in her report that additional examples or, or architectural standards will be part of the plan. We support that part of the plan. We think creating a unique location, uh, a unique spot here as the Eastern Gateway into Matthews is a, is a great concept. And I think uh, Mr. Vincat and, and, his, and, his and his fellow property owners support that vision. 
and would like to be part of implementing that vision. We support the idea of open space and green space as part of the new developments, and we support the branding of the area and creating that unique place that people like to visit that's a different place in Matthews. Uh, we think we can come forward with a plan that will help implement that unique area by allowing <clears throat> a variety of housing types and also allowing some small retail spaces that uh, maybe can be marketed to small entrepreneurs at a because they're small and unique, maybe at, at different at different price points. Uh, we like the ability of the plan to support a variety of housing and assorted sizes. I think by allowing a variety of housing types throughout the area, you will get a variety of and, and different sizes and shapes of housing that then can be uh, targeted at different price points. That gives everybody an opportunity who wants to be here at least to find a housing look, a housing type that fits their economic model and their lifestyle. So allow, allowing that variety of housing types is a great goal. We think we can we can help implement that. Uh, like residential density will the like the recommendation that residential gen, density will generally progress from higher density next to the interstate to lower density, but we think the plan should also uh, provide some opportunities to do that with something other than single family. The 15 acres that we're 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 focused on is up against Windrow and Spring and the Spring Spring. I'm not going to remember the last name of the the Windrow neighborhood. And the plan, the concept plan, predominantly shows single family there. We think there are other ways to make that transition and still create an appropriate buffer and transition to the single family neighborhood, but then still hopefully implement that unique place, create a little a destination by adding some ground floor retail potentially in that location, that far, farther northern end of the plan, instead of up against the interstate we provide some more walkable amenities to the rest of the community. Uh, the recommended layout that's in the plan, I think it would be good, if, and I think Nadine mentioned this, this is a concept, it's not the only way. We'd like to make sure that there are other options that could be considered as ways to implement the recommendations of the plan, not just that that, plan, <clears throat> that, recommended, plan, that recommended plan that's in, the, in the, the small area plan is the only way to implement the goals. We think there ought to be there are other ways to do that. Uh, would be again. I think I've mentioned this three or four times. <clears throat> excuse me, fighting off a cold. We believe a good transition can be made by by a variety of housing types and and both mixed use mixed with a variety of house, but also mixed use residential retail under under residential small scale unique inwardly focused as the plan talks about providing some opportunities for again like I mentioned smaller entrepreneurs that can take advantage of these small, unique places. And then that in itself creates a unique walkable uh, location. Uh, in closing, I think we like the recommendations of the Air Plan. We think it does a great job of introducing a different way to look at residential development here, not just let's do a little multifamily here, a little single family here. It is about integrating the variety of housing types and uses together to create a walkable, unique location, and we embrace that part of it. We just would like to see a little bit more uh, flexibility and in, in, in ways to implement that as, as specific proposals come in through the rezoning process, and hopefully that can be part of the plan. Then, Kat, I know there are other comments that you wanted to add, so I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, okay. my name is Venkat Suridevara, and we own that uh, three parcels, almost 15 acres. I think Mr. Keith, you covered everything. So I want to say thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank you to everyone. And uh, I very much appreciate it. And a few things I would like to add is, I think, you know, uh, probably uh, mixed use development, we would like to develop a, if opportunity is given, we would like to develop a, a really, really good mixed use you know, where the neighbors can walk in. And also at the same time, we would like to, you know, uh, look at the um, opportunity to offer some kind of affordability to like a, we look at some percentage and we can come upon that to, which can help you know police and uh, you know or fire and then uh, teachers you know etc thank you thank you thank you mayor mayor pro tem members of the board uh, we appreciate thank your you. time and the, and the opportunity to speak thanks sure Thank you, Keith and Venkat. Uh, Lori, you, can you read the entire uh, email from uh, 
Stallings, Mayor, please. Absolutely, one moment, please. Okay, he says, I have reviewed the small area plan at the corner of Idlewild and I-485 and am not in favor due to high density housing and the lack of infrastructure to handle the increased traffic. I support multi-use, but there is way too much density without infrastructure to allow flow of traffic and maintain high quality of life. Thank you, Wyatt Dunn, Mayor, Town of Stallings. Okay, thank you, Lori. Uh, I will read the paragraph once again. Uh, anyone in the Zoom audience that would like to make comments can do that now by raising their hand using the raise hand feature. Uh, if you're on a desktop, desktop or mobile device, you can click the raise hand in the webinar controls. You'll be recognized by the name listed in your Zoom window. If you're on a telephone, dial star nine and you'll be recognized by your telephone number. Uh, Lori, do we have anybody uh, that would like to comment? Yes, sir. We have Tony. Uh, Tony, if you can turn your mic and your camera on and please state your first and last name for the record once you begin speaking. Yeah, I'm Tony Williamson. I live on 13224 Saddle Tree Court. And yes, I've, I've been in some of, some of your meetings uh, and I know, John, you know me. I've spoken out six years ago when we did have uh, the recommendation to uh, from the planning committee to go ahead and place a very high density uh, urban setting there at the Stallings and 45 Ottawa intersection. And one of the reasons I have been very much against this high density was because of the traffic and the accidents. And I think, John, you remember me telling you, I used to be a medic with Charlotte. And uh, I saw a lot of high density going places where should never been, and this is one of them. And if you've seen the number of accidents I've seen at Starlin's, it's, it's, it's very, very concerning. I mean, that was six years ago. And you and, you and a, another board member were the only ones that were descending to, to continue to move forward, but the rest of the board saw what we saw, and they said, no, we're not. So I plead with everybody there, please listen to us. It's not because we don't care about the, you know, so much high density, it's the involvement of other people's lives. And, and I've seen too many fatalities in my life and I, I don't wanna see more, especially now it's so close to home. Um, the roundabout where it will be with this new project will not be where the accidents are gonna occur. It's gonna occur at Stalins in Ottawa. And that's where we've seen numerous accidents. I go down that road just about every day. And, you know, my involvement uh, with the community has been pretty strong. And, you know, one of the things that I always see and always recognize, I'm still on guard. I still keep a first aid, you know, uh, trauma box in my car. And uh, there are many times where I feel I have to jump in if I see something that's really, you know, concerning. And I will. Um, the last time we had this discussion about this project six years ago, John, I think, you know, we reached out to the news media. And we did get uh, you know, some news channels to follow this story. And we'll do it again. I'm not concerned about the high density. I'm concerned about people's lives. And I think this is a very, you know, we don't have bus lanes. You don't even have a bus. Uh, you're talking about people staying home. How they're going to get around uh, if they can't get outside and make those turns and get onto the Ottawa Road. And you don't have a bus transportation in the area. There's no public busing uh, going through that area. So that's another concern. Uh, there's just too many negatives of this project. And I think the Starlings mayor put it bluntly, and I think everybody should listen. I think that's a very important uh, concern of everybody in this area. Okay, thank you for those comments. Uh, Lori, do we have anybody else that has uh, raised their hand? No, sir. All right, well, uh, I think one comment that we've heard pretty strongly tonight is a, a real concern about the infrastructure there. So uh, perhaps at a future date, we can get a, uh, an update on what the, what, uh, what NCDOT's ultimate plans are for Ottawa and when that may actually happen. And, and I know we've seen that uh, stalled quite a bit lately, a lot of projects, but uh, it'd be interesting to get, get an update on that. Uh, and I, I think it's all in flux right now, to be honest. 
I don't know if CJ or Susan care to comment on that. I, I would, Mayor, thank you for asking. So uh, we, we hear you loud and clear about the traffic and that's another reason why we revamped the TIA. We included transportation uh, analysis, right? Not just traffic. And as I mentioned previously, we added crash analysis to the TIA requirements. And so as developers move through the process to implement parts of this plan, they will be required if they meet the thresholds, they'll be required to study and make improvements uh, for the impacts of their development. So the reason that we haven't done it now is because this is just a, a plan. It's not, it's not an actual development. When, you, when the board uh, adopts the plan and then a developer comes through to build out part of the plan, then you'll get the opportunity then for them to move through the, the TIA process and then the recommended improvements, just as you've seen for other developments. So I hope that clarifies a, a little bit about that because Nadine did ask us about it. And, and my answer was just that as developers come in, they'll be required to do TIA. And with this expanded TIA mitigation process, there's more, more components to it rather than just adding turn lanes. And I know that any planned in infrastructure improvements to Ottawa were, have been greatly pared down recently, including the roundabout that they were gonna put there, right? So. Yeah, the DOT really shortened up the project limits on the Matthew side. Right. So uh, appreciate everybody's comments. Nadine, we appreciate the uh, comprehensive report. And um, if there was no further comment, uh, this so application will be heard by the planning board on October 26th and come back to the Board of Commissioners on November 8th. So thank you, everyone. I will now entertain a motion to reconvene our regular meeting. So moved. I have a second. I'll second. A motion from Commissioner McCool, a second from Commissioner Whitley. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. I vote yes as well. So we're now back in our regular meeting. We'll go on to the planning and development business. Item 10A, receive a report from the planning board, uh, from the planning board vice chair, Natasha Edwards. Natasha? Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Um, for last, last month's uh, planning board meeting, we uh, reviewed the following. The rezoning application for 2021, 2021 734 uh, West John office to change a certain R20 district to OCD on certain property identified as 556 West John Street. Uh, tax parcel 193-251-11. Uh, members of the planning board viewed an updated site plans that address landscape buffers, signage, and building square footage maximums. The applicant is continuing to work to comply with the town's parking requirements. The planning board has recommended approval conditional on the applicant's continued work with staff on resolving parking. The request was found to be consistent with the Matthews land use plan because it both preserved and enhanced a property in a historic part of Matthews and provides a residential style office cottage as envisioned along John Street. For the second application, uh, 2021 738 Meadows at Matthews, uh, to change the conditions from a certain RVS zoning district located at 105, 109, 115, 119, 125, 129, and 133 Matthews Township Parkway, Parkway and being seven lots known as the Meadows at Matthews. Set conditions to allow a six foot fence uh, in the front setback. Planning board reviewed the request to update the flexible design standards of the RVS zoned neighborhood. Members recommended the change of conditions for approval. The request was found to be consistent with the Matthews land use plan because it would allow an increase in privacy and safety for a limited number of residents with front yards along Highway 51 four lane corridor. The rezoning request was found to be reasonable because it provided an option for a limited number of property owners along a busy four lane thoroughfare for six foot fence in the front yard setback. The third application we heard was a text amendment uh, and it was 2021-739 Matthews Presbyterian Church UDO text amendment related to Columbaria. 
The members review both parts of the text amendment request and per staff suggestion, only motion to recommend approval for the first part of the text amendment that would provide a definition of an open wall columbarium. The proposal would also allow an exemption from the definition for columbaria that are eight feet or less in height. The request was found to be consistent with the Matthews land use plan because it continued to provide provide quality institutional facilities for all citizens in all needs. The rezoning request was found to be reasonable because it provided clarification to missing definitions in the ordinance. The fourth was the public improvement variance, the Elida properties, 9805 East uh, Northeast Court and 1939 Rice Road. Request to eliminate and any requirement to construct curb and gutter along the site's frontage on Sam Newell Road. The planning board reviewed the request and the updated development site plan for the Crown Point project. Members unanimously agreed approval to allow an exemption of the curb and gutter placement due to the U2509 NCDOT project that would be affecting the portion of Sam Newell Road. And that's what all I have for you guys tonight. Hey. Thank you. Are there any questions on the planning board report for Natasha? Mr. Miller. Thank you, Natasha. This is very small, but you mentioned that on the meadows at Matthews about the fence that it was adjacent to a four lane uh, 51. Isn't it really five lanes there? I guess if you, is it five lanes? If you can, if you consider the turn lane yeah there's a center turn lane between uh charred cross and onward past uh sardis is there okay i think and and that's my question <laughs> I, it really is i think it's five lanes there is which is substantial on on our exception recommendation sure um jay could you Go ahead, Natasha. I'm sorry. Do you know the answer to that, Jay? If that's if it's five, five, and then I think there's a right turn lane on the Sardis as well. So five or six. I'd have to pull up an aerial. <laughs> so more than four. Four or more. <laughs> four, or more. Yeah, four, or more. four or more. There you go. Pretty a lot. Commissioner Irving. Uh, Natasha. So in your uh, 2021 738 Meadows case, uh, yes. you made a recommendation and a motion. But your your solution was fences should be consistent and not have a variety of styles. Was that part of your recommended motion, or was that just a discussion point? I think it was a part of the discussion because if I remember correctly, that we had concerns about putting that how I think because there might be we were concerned about the cost of certain. Uh, fence types, you know, if it was going to be, I think our suggestion was that it should be consistent, but we were concerned about putting in um, exact wording, if I remember correctly, about what exactly those were due to cost of, you know, a brick fence versus a wood. But the discussion point that was, is the group of, group of citizens coming together to talk about this so they can actually work through that process to mm -hmm. find a common denominator. Would they mm -hmm. not be able to do that? I think possibly they could, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Move on to 10B1 zoning application 2021-734 West John office to change that certain R20 district to OCD on that certain property identified as 556 West John Street and further identified as tax parcel 1932511. Uh, Nadine, you're up again. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so as you said, this is at um, 556 West John Street. Uh, the request is for R20 to office conditional district and they want to put a, a law office there. Uh, you might remember that at the public hearing, we asked them to make additional notes on the plan to um, to clarify the landscaping buffer. When they did that, it kind of threw off their parking. So by the time it got to the planning board, they had not presented uh, a revised parking plan, um, which is why 
the planning board's recommendation was basically approved contingent um, upon them uh, bringing a workable plan. So last week they did send in a revised plan that actually meets the requirements of the ordinance. Um, Jay and I looked at it and we were okay with it. We sent it to Public Works and Susan, town engineer, had some concerns about it. Um, and she thought that a better layout would be possible. Um, and again, it didn't meet the requirements of our zoning ordinance, but she thought something better could be done. Uh, because we don't wanna hold them up any further, I'm sure you've seen the house out there with a the blue tarp on it. Um, we think that you can approve this if you choose to. Um, and note that the parking layout will be finalized during the permitting process. And I've discussed this with Susan and she is comfortable with that. So we do recommend this evening that you can approve it. Um, but again, it would be the permitting, um, the parking layout would be approved during the permitting process. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> Okay, is uh, is Susan still on the call? I can't see the. Uh, do you want me to stop sharing? Yes, please. Yes, I'm here. Susan, could you maybe just explain what your what your concerns were? Yeah, sure. They're pretty minor, and like Nadine said, it, it's very easily resolved in the in the permit phase. I would like to talk to the designer about um, just some configurations. There's you know, when I counted up, I could get like nine spaces in there. They have seven and it's like all covered in asphalt with, you know, and I feel like there could be some minor tweaks that would make um, for a better experience um, and a vis better visual impact or a lesser visual impact than just an entire paved backyard. Uh, and so I okay. think if I could just talk to the designer, I think it can be worked out very, very easily. Okay, thank you. And I'd, like to, I'd like to also mention that um, a lot of these problems was because they were trying to save that accessory structure there um, to give it more of that residential feel. Right. Commissioner Miller. Thank you. Um, for clarification, I believe they have a double corner lot between West John Street and Charles Street and Lois Street. Is that accurate? They are the corner lot. I'm not sure if it's a double. It's a I believe it's a double corner lot because most of the lots go between John Street and Charles Street deep. And as and the only reason I bring that up is because as an example, the yellow building uh, Roger Martin built, uh, he acquired or built plenty of parking in the back and we discussed it and made sure that there was shrubbery to to hide the bumpers and the tail lights, And so to Susan's point, I think it's easily solved. Uh, we just have to do a design and maybe the accessory building is not as needed as it would have been in the beginning. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that. I believe that they have enough space. So Commissioner Hill, that lot does, no go, does not go all the way through. It there's a, a, a an office building right there at the corner of West Charles and Lois. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And the applicants should be here. I know they were signed on. If they want to say anything. Before we do that, are are there any? Uh, any would anybody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the requested zoning action 2020-734 as most currently amended uh, because it has been found to be consistent with the Matthews land use plan because it both preserves and enhances property in a historic part of Matthews and provides a residential style office cottage as envisioned along John Street. It's also reasonable in that it is in keeping with other uses along the corridor. Did Second. you mention? Did you mention the conditional portion of it? Up above there. Give me better direct. Oh with the condition that the applicants provide an updated and acceptable parking layout prior, well, um, during permitting. 
Does that cover it? I think so. Do you still second that, Commissioner Miller? Yes, sir. Is there any further discussion? Let's take a uh, roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. I vote yes as well. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Move on to the next one, uh, 10B2 zoning application 2021-738 Meadows at Matthews to change the conditions of that certain RVS zoning district located at 105, 109, 115, 119, 125, 129, and 133 Matthews Township Parkway and being seven lots known as the Meadows at Matthews said conditions to allow a six foot fence in the front setback, Mr. Will. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Um, no changes have been proposed since the public hearing. However, um, as it was mentioned uh, at the planning board meeting, it was brought up that the fences should be consistent and not have a variety of styles. Um, the recommended motion is to approve zoning application 2021-738 to use flexible design standards in the RVS zoning district to allow for six foot tall front uh, six foot tall fence in the front yard setback for the Meadows of Matthews. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the board may have at this time. Commissioner Miller. Thank you. Um, Rob, I'm, I'm confused about the later um, agenda item stating a withdrawal. Was that a secondary route to go? Yes, sir. Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, it was a secondary route that okay. um, if this was not uh, is not a favorable vote and this then staff's recommending withdrawal. Then I would like to make a motion to approve zoning app 2020-738 using the flexible design standards available in the RVS zoning district to allow for a six foot tall fence in the front yard setback. And it is consistent in that the change of zoning conditions follows the land use plan because it will allow an increase in privacy and safety for a limited number of residents with front yards along the highway 51 four, five, maybe even six lane corridor, and that it is reasonable in that the change in zoning conditions provides an option for a limited number of property owners along a busy four lane thoroughfare for a six foot fence in the front yard setback. I'll Thank you, Commissioner that. Miller. We have a second from Commissioner I'll Whitley. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Whitley. Are, is there any further discussion? Proud to do it. Mr. Urban. I still want to circle back to, to Rob and all about the consistent fence. Um, I, I'm a little concerned that we get a patchwork and, and then you have another petition along the same thoroughfare and they do a patchwork. So and I don't mind them if, if the neighbors could all work together to come to some common denominator, like I mentioned before, and maybe the petitioner can talk to that. But I'm just, I'm just a little concerned about red, blue, pink, purple, green as opposed to one consistent look. Um, there's a lot of ways to achieve it inexpensively that would achieve what we're trying to do, but that, that's my concern. And I don't know if we need to amend the motion, that there's some consistency, it'll be worked out with staff. Um, maybe the petitioner wants to talk to it, but I, I do have a concern with that. If I could uh, make a comment to that point, um, perhaps we could uh, leave it to the, to the the neighbors there to talk amongst themselves. I don't want to be overly prescriptive and say it has to be, you know, three quarter inch, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe if we can get a, a just a, a, for lack of a better term, a gentleman's agreement that the neighbors will work together to build something that's consistent and not, not a patchwork. And I don't know if the, if, if the applicants would like to discuss that. Tasha, do you have your hand raised? 
I do. I just wanted to clarify. I was looking back through our notes from the meeting. So if, if you don't mind, if I clarify what we discussed real quick. Oh, sure, um, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So what we had was um, uh, Carrie mentioned to make the fences. He would like, he mentioned that he would like the same, you know, he had the same concern that uh, Mr. Urban has and that he would encourage the property owners to um, do a uniform fence. And, and the reason they don't have a homeowners association on those lots. So that was part of the, you know, the issue that we were having that there are no, that would be something typically, um, you know, provided within the, the terms of the, of the HOA. Um, and so what was, we did talk about, um, so he did, so the petitioner did mention that they are looking to use the same contractor to install his fence as his neighbor used. So I think there are some talks already and having some consistency um, amongst the neighbors already. So just wanted to clarify what was more closely said. Can I ask uh, what what staff is, is uh, comfortable with? Do you think we need to clarify this in writing? What, what would be the recommended addition? Jay, do you have any suggestions? Well, I would, I would first, anything that you want to include with the motion, the applicants would need to agree to. And we do have multiple applicants here. So it's uh, a little bit difficult to do at the at the 11th hour. But I, I think just some uh, a general statement that maybe the, the fence material type style would generally be consistent. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm in favor of. Commissioner Urban? I, I just, yeah, I think if you could say there's a wording, it says uniform and consistent. There's no prescription in it. There's no black, brown, six, you know, big pickets, little bit. Uniform and consistent lays out a concept that I think everybody could agree to in that terms. I don't want to, I don't want to leave it up to the neighbors because we may get petitions down the road, but if we continually use the terminology of uniform and consistent, that should drag that ball forward. He's and it's cheaper to hire the same contractor to do one fence yes. across six lots yes. than six different contractors. Yes. Uh, Celine, do you have a comment, sir? You're, uh, you're muted. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mayor, th th thanks for letting me speak. Uh, now, let me just remind uh, the commissioners and the mayor and uh, all the staff that five of the seven houses already have a five foot tall wall, brick wall, red brick wall. And if, if a six foot fence is built inside the brick wall, that will hardly make any difference at all. And no one is going to take down that brick wall. That is a nice, pretty looking brick wall. Now the remaining two houses, which is me and my neighbor, when we moved in, she already had the fence on. So I used the same contractor as she did. And both of our fences are exactly the same. Okay. So, so you have a situation where five of the seven houses have a five foot tall brick wall and two houses have exactly the same fence. So we are already um, in the same spread uh, with the, what you are asking for. And, and, and more, moreover, better just wait. Um, moreover, <laughs> my wife is going to visit her mother. Uh, she wasn't feeling well, so I'm babysitting. Uh, excuse me. So um, a lot of, at least I can see three of the houses with the wall. They have already planted uh, those evergreen trees. And now you can see those trees um, above the wall as you drive by. And last, January, I planted evergreen trees outside my house, uh, my fence. So that, that will be hidden a, a lot. I mean, we, we are willing to. Bit of wait. It's not too loud. Am I talking too loud? Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I, I'll be a bit quiet. Okay, so, so uh, I think there is no, uh, re, I mean, the concern uh, we have. Uh, Okay, I'll quiet down. So we have already taken into it. Okay, I'm, I'll stop talking. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for that clarification. Um, seeing as two of the fences are already built and are uniform, I don't think we should require those folks to build a brick fence. Uh, Commissioner Urban, you have a comment? No, I, well, no, because you could have brick as 
a part of that fence system. It could be brick and regular fence and brick or, or a combination. That's still in my mind uniform and consistent. It's an ABAB -B rhythm to some degree. But what I'm a little confused is if we already have brick walls up, why are they involved in this action for this fence? What, what, what am I missing here? Are we really just talking about two yards that we're dealing with? They're, they're non-conforming as far as I know, the other five. Is that correct, Jay? Uh, relating to the brick wall? Yes. Yeah, the, so the current wall is a foot taller than the code would have typically allowed. So the key here is you're going to take, you, you by working the text amendment, you're going to make these non-conforming uses come to conformance. And so the bricks will, the brick walls will be permissible. And then the two other neighbors will do their fence and, and everybody's fine and dandy is what you're saying, Jay. Yeah. If, if this, if this motion passes the, uh, the fence that the variance request failed for the six foot privacy fence, that would now be in conformance as well as the brick wall. Correct. To be clear, all of the fences are already built, correct? They're already there. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> so we're, uh, we're approving what is there. <laughs> yes, did right. you have another, did you have another comment? No, I, I just think it's, a, it's, 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 this is not the way to go about it. I, uh, Jeff Miller is usually the one to talk about going in reverse from the standpoint, but if, if uniform and consistent means you can do brick walls and or picket fences, I'd rather have that in the motion as at least two standards which people could do. So I don't know what Salim built, but if he built a picket fence, that would be one of the, the elements that's acceptable and brick would be the other acceptable one, just so there is some consistency to the motion. I'm only one of seven, like I said. Mr. Whitley. Yeah, I, I think it's clear. I think we're talking about a mute point. Uh, the fence is already there. The board, uh, planning board has already approved it. We got a motion and a seconds on the floor. And let's get rid of this. We've been talking about this thing for over five months. So Commissioner Whitley, what if we get a petition across the street a year from now and they decide they want to build a stone wall? Is that we'll what we'll deal with it at that time? Let's move forward on this. So then we have a quilt patchwork. So if everybody's in agreement, We'll have a quilt patchwork on the major thoroughfares. It's not patchwork now. We'll, we'll, it, it, this is a project that we count on now. Unintended right. consequence. We'll deal with that if it comes down the road. Mr. Miller. It might not be perfect, but I'm proud of the fact that we're solving a problem in our little hometown for our neighbors. Uh, you know, we could have two more brick walls instead of the uh, fence, but I don't think it's a picket fence because you can't see it through a pick. You can see through a picket fence. It's a privacy fence. Um, you know, don't stain them two different colors and we'll be good. I, I'm sorry, sir. We, I, I think I'm going to call the question. We've had a motion and a second. Uh, and I'd like to call the question. So we'll, um, we'll go ahead and take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Go ahead, yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Whitley. Yes, sir. I vote yes as well, that passes unanimously. So uh, I hope uh, gentlemen that you will uh, keep <laughs> Keep your two fences consistent uh, to, to Commissioner Urban's point. Thank, Thank you, you, Salim and Greg. You're you're approved. Thank you. All right, so we'll we'll move on to the next one. Uh, 10B3 zoning application 2021-739 text amendment to change the text of the existing UDO to clarify the definition of a columbarium as a wall and not a structure. This was submitted by the Matthews Presbyterian Church, and Darren Hallman will present it. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I did just want to know, I'm having some internet stability issues, so I was just going to leave my video off uh, during the presentation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, so as mentioned, um, this, uh, uh, this text amendment is to add a definition for open wall columbaria. Um, 
So right now, our UDO does not have definitions for Calabaria or open wall Calabaria, even though it makes a reference to both of those in the ordinance. Um, for Calabaria, it would just default to the uh, Merriam-Webster de uh, definition, but there's no definition for that for an open wall columbarium. So that's why the applicant's seeking to add that. Um, so essentially what this would do is it would just give that definition and then it would also include an exemption for the walled columbariums. So that anything that was eight feet or less would be exempt from the definition and would be considered just a standard wall or a fence. Uh, Planning Board did make a recommendation to approve this. Um, initially, they, it was a two-part text amendment, and they've also removed the second part. Uh, Jay, if you could scroll down. So this is a text that would be added. Um, an open wall con burial. Show me an open aired wall lined with vaults or niches for funerary urns um, that has a, uh, a height greater than eight feet. Open wall columbarium less than the height standards of this de definition shall be treated as a wall. Uh, Jay, if you could scroll. So these are just a few examples of what we're talking about. Um, so by our ordinance now, if these structures didn't have the vaults lining them, they would just be considered a wall. Um, and in that case, we wouldn't really have any regulations for them. If you could continue scrolling. Beautiful. And so this last image at the bottom, um, this is actually an example of something that would not be exempt. So this would be considered a columbarium by our definition and all of the all the uh, ordinances that we have in place now, they would currently apply to that structure. Um, this text amendment and definition really only seeks to, I guess, kind of allow the, uh, the smaller columbarium and only the wall structures. Uh, that includes the staff update. Are there any questions? And I believe the applicants are here as well, if there's any questions for them. Okay, are there any questions or motions? Mr. Miller. Thank you, I'll make a motion. We approve zoning application 2021-739 to add a definition of open wall columbarium. It's consistent with the Matthews land use plan as it continues to provide quality institutional facilities for all citizens and all needs. needs. And it's reasonable in that uh, it provides clarification to missing definitions in the ordinance. Second. second that. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Miller, a second. I heard Commissioner McCool first, Commissioner Whitley. So we'll say Commissioner McCool. Take a roll call vote, Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. I vote yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to the uh, last one on our planning and development business tonight. Motion 2021-1 text amendment to the UDO to allow a six foot fence in the front yard setback along major thoroughfares with proper setbacks and vegetative screening. Mr. Will. There we go. Okay. Um, well, at this time, um, staff recommends withdrawal of this text amendment um, because this was in response to the Meadows and Matthews um, approval. So um, that would be the staff recommendation at this time. Mr. Whitley. I make a motion that we withdraw uh, motion 2021-1 text at this time. I'll second that. We have a motion from Commissioner Whitley, a second from Mayor Pro Tem Garner. We'll take a roll call vote, seeing no discussion, correct? Uh, Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote, sir? Yes. Commissioner Urban? 
Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. I vote yes, that passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 11, the consent agenda. I'll make a motion that we accept consent agenda A through D. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Whitley. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes, sir. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. I vote yes as well. We'll move on to item 12, unfinished business. Consider request for funding for detailed construction documents for the Matthews Veterans Memorial Park. Corey King, and I need to apologize to Corey because it seems like he always is the last at the bottom of our uh, agendas nearly every time, but uh, Corey, you're up. All right, I'm here. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Town Board. Um, so on August 23rd, uh, the board saw options for Stumptown Park uh, and Veterans Memorial Park. Uh, the board did reach consensus on uh, concept B. Uh, and actually, uh, Jay, or could you share the, the image of the, uh, the layout? Sure, give me one moment here and I'll pull it up. And so work with uh, the engineering firm. Uh, they had done a, a good job to date, and the staff did feel that, well, staff, staff felt confident that Stuart would continue to do a good job and produce the detailed construction documents, uh, which will be the next step uh, in this project. So if you can actually, where the image goes from the color to the more grayed out, you can see the picnic tables in that aerial, that space, that picnic area, as well as some regrading uh, re of some sidewalk uh, in, uh, in the park. As part of the construction documents, the, the deliverables uh, would be an existing conditions plan, uh, any necessary permitting, a site demo plan, site layouts, elevations, uh, materials and furnishings, a schedule and a plan for those, uh, grading plan, <clears throat> stormwater and erosion plan, a landscape plan, uh, and also any necessary meetings uh, between steward and staff. So for this product, Stewart has proposed a cost of uh, $36,800 to complete the task. Uh, Stewart also did offer a uh, cost to manage the project bidding and construction observation and project closeout. Staff did feel at this point, uh, we would sort of reevaluate as we got closer to, to bidding. Uh, we may be able to handle those tasks in house. Uh, so, Looking at the cost that Stewart has proposed to design the construction documents, uh, staff also does recommend a 10% contingency uh, to cover those unknown unknowns. Uh, so total ask tonight is a uh, total of $40,480 uh, for the construction documents for the project. And tourism fund balance is the proposed source of, of funding for this. Glad to answer any questions. Corey, uh, I thought that the last time we spoke, there was a, um, I, I, I'm pretty certain there was a consensus to add additional seating. And also there was a discussion about making the interest, entrance and egress or whatever, the two sides more symmetrical. Um, is, yeah. is that still being considered or? Yes. The, the plan still shows it as it was. Yeah. So we haven't done any more work with Stuart. They so you'd say they accomplished all the tasks uh, that we hired them to do. Uh, the changes that, that you just mentioned are in the notes from that meeting. And once we get to this next stage of uh, call it creating the specs, that's when those notes, uh, things will be incorporated into any new designs. And this uh, is just to uh, do the plans and we'll be able to come back and, and discuss them and make any final tweaks, correct? The board will. Correct. We'll be at uh, roughly, uh, we'll likely bring it back to the board at 50%. And then again, at a uh, little greater than say 90% uh, completion for the documents. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Urban. That's, you clarified that because Corey's mentioning 
design development, which would allow you to make some tweaks and come back before the board. But I want to clarify as to what the town's approach is to these contingencies. Um, I think there's a little misnomer in here. It talks about not dealing with the bidding at $10,800. It's just not bidding. The bidding is only $2,000. The construction administration is $5,400 and project closeout was $3,400, which made up that $10,800 add on the end there. Yeah. Um, I don't know you need project closeout because your general contractor can do that. But then the question is, is CA uh, and bidding? And in the past, we've had third parties like George Fawcett or, or um, uh, Williams handle some of these components. I'm just wondering how did the town, just in, since it's just not bidding, how is the town thinking about doing CA and project closeout? I do think I mean, in my opinion, <clears throat> looking at the scale of this project, um, it may come down to say what else is on, I'll say my plate. Um, I do think that uh, we'll certainly reevaluate re -evaluate once the, the documents are done uh, and we're sort of getting ready to go to bid. Uh, if it is something that we can handle in the house, um, I'd say we save the money and do it in house. Uh, if it is something that is just sort of, uh, say if my plate's too full, uh, along with, help from Susan also uh, looking at our workloads. If it's something that we don't feel we could handle, we would come back to the board and ask for those dollars. Well, then, then what I would ask is when you get to that point, when the con when the um, architect, landscape architect starts looking at <clears throat> setting up a list of submittals for the contractors to submit, that your team looks at that and see if you are capable of reviewing those submittals um, you may actually have to drag in uh, Ralph uh, a little bit, but I'm, I'm thinking about that because CA shouldn't be taken lightly. It is your last defense to correcting things uh, in the construction process. So if something gets through in the submittal, you can end up having some finger pointing at the end there uh, as a contractor, you now as a landscape architect, now the owner approved it. So you uh, just want to be cautious about that. So when that time comes is to, is to, have a really in-depth discussion about it because in the past I know we've had third party people handle this and, and you might want to consider that again uh, with somebody or put a team together. I don't know which. Yeah, I agree 100%. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions or motions? Commissioner Miller. Just a stupid question. Um, this is only drawings and concepts, but it doesn't include the price tag of the final product. Is that correct? Mm. Correct. This is the documents that we will physically hand to the contractor to then build from. This does not include the cost to actually build it. And do we have an idea or a guesstimation of it's going to be 50,000 or 100,000 or? quarter of a million so the estimated cost uh, from based on the just based on the conceptual designs uh, for B was roughly one hundred ninety thousand dollars and now we did add the regrading of the sidewalks and the improvements to the picnic area um, I don't really have a good cost for that um, but we will work that in as part of the design documents is uh, asking for some updated estimate or cost estimate for the entire project okay thank you and depending on what kind of fence y'all do in the back, that could significantly increase the price as well. Yeah, that's been a big discussion point among several people. So see how we do that. All right, once again, are there uh, any motions anybody would like to make? Mr. McCool. I'll make a motion that we authorize the town manager to enter into an agreement with Stewart Engineering to produce construction documents for Stumptown Park Veterans Memorial Park project and approve the, do these be two separate motions? The, or all in one? I think they're going to be all in one. Okay. And approve the appropriation of $40,480 from tourism fund balance to fund the cost of producing the construction documents. I'll Thank second. you, Commissioner McCool. We have a second by Commissioner Whitley. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes, sir. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. 
Commissioner Miller. Yes. I vote yes as well. Why we're being so divisive tonight? All of our everything's going unanimous. So thank you. Thank you. Move on to thank you, Corey. We'll move on to 12B. Consider the sidewalk project for Moore Road and Marglin Drive. Uh, Susan. Mayor and Commissioners, uh, last month, staff presented uh, an informational item to you uh, regarding a sidewalk gap project on Moore and Marglin, uh, Mount, ha uh, Mount Harmony Road. We've since met with CARPO staff and also received feedback from town staff. <coughs> so uh, the following few bullets uh, have been updated for this item tonight. First is on um, the sidewalk is five feet wide. Um, except for the um, sections about 460 feet between Royal Park Greenway and the Matthews Point Apartments near Matthews Mint Hill Road. And that's to accommodate Greenway traffic as uh, Royal Park continues to extend their Greenway. The second one is that the, uh, well, the line items and the cost estimate increased per the request of CRTPO, which um, brought the estimate to $2.7 million for the entire project. And that means the town share is $549,000. Um, not, not sure how your reaction to that would be. So the staff looked at how we could um, get the project back towards the original estimate we presented last month. So we talked about reducing the scope a bit to bring it back down closer uh, to what we shared previously. And we've offered that in the memo. Um, and then lastly, um, we promised to talk about a uh, funding source and, and do we have the capability? And we do have a statement. Uh, if Jay, if you would scroll down to the top of the next page, uh, there's a statement there about the source of the match. And uh, regardless of which scope you choose, whether you choose the full scope of the project or the, or the reduced scope, uh, we have the ability to cover that cost. Uh, combination of general fund revenues, appropriation of general fund balance, and or if applicable bond revenue. So the recommended action tonight, look, staff really would like to do the full project. It, as Dana mentioned before, it connects um, dense housing on both ends of the project, to schools on both ends of the project, providing a lot more walkable opportunity for the residents of the area. And, uh, and that's the request. Happy to answer any questions at this time. Are there any questions? Commissioner Urban. Okay, and I'll make it on the roll tonight. So let me ask you a question, Susan. If we apply for this at CPG grant and we get it, is there anything that says that we're committed to it? I mean, you, how's that work? Step, question number one. So we, uh, once upon a time, applied for uh, similar dollars. They were under a different name at the time to, um, to do a side path along um, Pleasant Plains Road. And once we really looked into the cost estimate because of the bridge over 45, it, it completely inflated the price, the price and we felt we couldn't afford the match. And so we, we turned in the money. We basically sent a letter that says, we can't afford the match anymore. This cost has escalated to the point where it's not, it's not doable for us. And that money got reabsorbed into the pot and was allocated to other projects. So we have turned away, uh, turned it back in money before and canceled projects. Okay. Well, I guess it just is a question because you've got a conversation in here later about uh, composite bicycle and pedestrian plan and sidewalks. And it's hard to talk about this through Zoom, not having a 530, not really vetting it, because I guess my question is, uh, granted, it's anchored by two multifamily projects. But it's highly unlikely someone in a townhome is going to walk to the other end because there's nothing there. And it's highly unlikely that someone at Liberty uh, Assisted Living is going to walk the other way to Mount Harmony because there's nothing there. Now, I grant you, I'm a sidewalk proponent, love sidewalks, but nothing's going to happen for 10 years. Would $549,000 not be a great injection of funding for other sidewalk gaps from that standpoint? I, I get it, but, but I like the argument that the 549, you get a heck of a return on your investment. You get all that extra money, but the thing is, that's grand, but it's like a bridge to nowhere for a long period of time with the 549, you better invest it. So I just wanted to know, I'm all for proceeding with the STBG application and all, but should we get a chance to have a little bit more debate down the road with 549, create more connectivity, get more bang for the buck on 10 other projects than what we're talking about tonight. That's my only question. 
So, yeah, it, I'm assuming that you'd like some sort of response to that, um, even though it's, it's a really great point and that's something we'd love to hear the board discuss. Um, we're looking at other projects, remember from last month where we kind of grouped them into roughly that amount. And so there are other projects that could be done um, and, and frankly, using the, the carpo estimating does inflate the price yeah. um, as opposed to us kind of just doing it on our own. And that's definitely an option available to the board. If we want to set aside that money and just kind of chip away at that small gaps, that's fine. Um, and I, I will say I have seen people walking down the street on, on Stallings Road um, where they're going. I don't know. It looks like they're out exercising. So it would be okay. nice for them to have a sidewalk to exercise on even, especially for the houses. Um, Royal Park is expanded to um, for some um, townhomes and apartments out there as well. So you're right. The destinations maybe don't don't particularly 100% match um, what the what the origins are, but that nice continuous sidewalk would be a really great amenity to, a, to an area that doesn't have a lot of them. Thank you. Well, I'll add uh, my two cents. I, I favor the reduced scope just because I don't think our taxpayers should be carrying the water for something a developer should should pay for. Um, so I would I would favor the leaving a gap there for the time being. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, a bit over a half a million dollars uh, can go a, lot, a, a long way in a lot of other ways. And I remember Commissioner Urban suggesting that we start at the core of downtown with sidewalk gaps and move out. And this is pretty far out. And I, I was questioning, although I'm not intimate with the area, um, I was questioning, what is it connecting? Is there a school? Are there two neighborhoods? Um, I'm not sure what it is. And, and if it is an old folks home to a, a townhome development, not so much. I would like to get the walkability closer to downtown or closer to our existing uh, businesses and neighborhoods. Renee. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Um, <laughs> Susan, I think it would be helpful if we could, sh if you could share the screen and show the map that's on, uh, on the memo so that we can all see the schools that are, um, that are linked by the sidewalk, as well as what projects are in process or may be proposed um, and then what gaps would be left? Yeah, great. So what we have showing, can you all see the map on my screen? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So we have the new um, Bainbridge apartments here at the top. And this is, um, I always forget the name of that. Matthew's Point Apartments is that older apartment complex here. Here's where the new apartments and townhomes are being built at Royal Park. Uh, of course, they're uh, age restricted. And then here you have this large single family neighborhood that already has sidewalks, but then it ends when they get to Marglin. We've got some single family homes here along Marglin. This section of sidewalk is existing uh, across when those homes were built. And then here on Mount Harmony Church Road, we have the school and the new townhome community in Mount Harmony Towns. The developer for Mount Harmony Towns will be building a 10 foot side path here on Mount Harmony Church Road. And the project would make some sort of connection under 45, depending on how NCDOT will allow us to provide accommodations there on that shoulder under the bridge. Then the five foot sidewalk, here's that vacant land kind of back over here. And I can bring up an aerial if you need uh, that the mayor was talking about. Uh, I am not, I have not heard that there's been any interest in developing that. Perhaps Jay has heard differently or someone from the planning department. So I'm not familiar of any any pending or, or new development uh, going on there at the corner. Then back up here is that gap right around that sharp curve. I'm sure you're all familiar with that sharp curve on Marglin, which is another reason we'd like to get people able to walk to their neighbors without having to walk in the road around that curve. Couple more single family homes. And then the developer at Royal Park is building this five, it's a five foot sidewalk uh, around the curve there on Moore Road, back to a five foot. And right here is where that greenway at Liberty come, comes out. 
And this is that section I was talking about would be 10 feet wide to accommodate the greenway traffic. Now this black section is built, uh, Bainbridge did um, rebuild a little bit of it for a right turn lane at five feet wide, but this section here is five feet wide, but we're not proposing to, to rebuild or widen any existing sections, just complete these gaps, which are in green here at Moore, and then these gaps here at Moore Glen. Does that um, meet your expectations, Mayor Pro Tem Garner? It does, and so I guess my question is why, um why this would rate higher or why you see an immediate need for it. I, I think personally before um, <laughs> before letting you speak, I see that the need is that um, I think, first of all, with, um, with the age restricted community, they're currently building, are they villas that are um, relatively affordable? Um, with no buy-in. So I think they're like, you know, between $1,200 and $1,600 a month, comparable to the one in price, to the one on Idlewild. Uh, you have neighbors who are going to walk dogs, um, obviously connecting the schools and to that greenway. So from my perspective, I understand the need and the immediacy, uh, but I'm curious what yours is, Susan. Yeah, we do think this will score well. When we were meeting with Carpo, we talked about the schools and the apartments, and that was attractive to them. Additionally, we have retail on this corner here, Matthews and Menhill Road, with some restaurants that the new residents are at Royal Park could easily get over and be able to walk to without having to walk in the street. Um, Matthews is great. They have we have very active seniors in Matthews. And so I guess our expectation would be those who move into Royal Park uh, would also be very active, much like they are over at Matthews Glen or any other um, you know, age targeted um, type developments that we have. And additionally, there's a couple of hotels here that front independence. And so they could you know, easily hop across uh, more road to, to get onto you know, the greenway or use a section to go up to the, the, res the um, the restaurants, if they didn't want to walk through that pothole alley back there. Thank you. You're welcome. Mayor? Uh, yes, Commissioner Miller. Uh, just a, a one comment. I would certainly support the more road green line, which is at the top of the proposed project because it connects apartments to retail and, and the um, age restricted community to retail, but I'm not so sure we need to continue to go out until we fill other gaps. Just an really, opinion. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> why, why are we making one development do 10 foot sidewalks and the Royal Park development right below that doing five foot when there's 10 foot above that. All the sidewalk out there is currently five feet. And, and I would say Commissioner Whitley is just, it was a missed opportunity uh, during their rezoning to, to require the 10 foot. And when they came in with their uh, development plan, uh, staff didn't feel like we could force them to do 10 feet. And so we only required five feet, which is what's currently on Marglin and what's currently on Moore Road. Okay, quick, quick, quick. Did, did you not say there was some part of 10 foot on Moore's Road? Uh, my apologies, I, I might have um, misspoke or not been clear. Uh, the staff would request that we build a 10 foot section um, in that gap between um, Royal Park and Matthews Point apartments. So that, that green gap that Commissioner Miller was talking about up on Moore Road, we would like to build that at 10 feet wide. I got you, okay, all right. Commissioner Urban. Um, and maybe it's a illegal question, but is, and I think where the mayor was going, is if other land around there develops, is there a way, I, I don't wanna use the word clawback, but it's the only word I have, I don't know if those lots are under rezoning, conditional rezoning, or probably will rezone, but is there the eventuality of having discussion with those petitioners to ha have a fee or something as part of that condition to offset the cost that we pay for these sidewalks? 
um, more of a pay to play situation because in some respects, a developer is gonna, we're gonna put the sidewalk in and the developer's going great, infrastructure done, a little less off my, my plate. Um, I, I just don't know, maybe Jay can respond to that a little bit uh, from, the, from that aspect. It all depends on the timing, right? And it is, and it is up to the board to make that choice. Do we fill this gap? Because that development might happen 10, 20 years from now, and this would be a usable piece of sidewalk for the people who are currently out there. And that's definitely a choice that, that you all will have to make to, to do that. Now, if the timing is such, the developer comes in first, you know, because there's a little bit of a delay on this. So, you know, it would be planning and in, in, engineering in 23 and right of way in 25 and construction in 27. If that piece comes in in that time, just like when, now that we're doing um, Sam Newell and Tennyson development came in right across the street from their current development, they are going to build that section because it's required in the land development standards that they build sidewalk across their front edge. And so as we're designing it, they are also designing their piece and they will construct their piece. So it, it's all a matter of timing. Well, so if you're talking about timing, what's the timing in, in filing for the STPG grants, the process, all that? I mean, if, if this is a year, 18 months, two year long process, does it not give us time to sort of take a breath, a file? I mean, what, there's no harm in it, file for it. If you get it, like you said, we can work on that. Um, and it gives us a little bit of room to sort of look at the big picture again to Commissioner Miller's point about, you know, filling in gaps elsewhere. But maybe the realization is that no, this is it. This is a good place to go and, and glad that we filed the application. That, that's available. I would caution against um, giving back too much money because uh, there's a lot of long memories on the project oversight committee at CARPO. And if someone remembers that we gave back the money on Pleasant Plains and then next year we get back the money on more Marglin, they might say, what's Matthews doing out there? And, um, you know, the matter is it is it urgent? Maybe, maybe not. Um, the, the deadline is the end of this month um, for this funding cycle. And there's two timelines proposed by CARPO. Um, the, the funding would be engineering in 25 and then two years after that. But they told us in our meeting, they want to accelerate some projects to 23. You know, Dana and I are all about building some sidewalks and getting stuff done because we're implementers. So we're like, yeah, we'll go for the early timeline. But if that's not the wish of the board, then we'll tell them, no, we'll stick with the engineering in 25, right away in 27, and construction in 29. That does give us more time and more opportunity for that corner parcel to develop uh, in that time frame. Because if, 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 we're talking bond packages potentially down the road. If there was a bond package that can kind of envelope this thing, then, then we can really tear at these sidewalks. Pardon that expression, it's kind of reverse. We could really build these sidewalks um, and open up that opportunity. I just hate, I hate losing the return on investment, but at the same time, I'm a little bothered by it being remote like it is. Um, and, and so many other people need sidewalks right now that could really, really utilize it. Uh, from that aspect of it. But again, these folks probably could use it too. So I'm just wondering what our options are. Do we have some time in this aspect of it? Thank you. And I think what Dana and Susan have done, we've, they, they are looking at CARPO, I mean, the, the, the standards and saying, what are the best projects for the standards, which are schools, neighborhoods, and they're, you know the infill, which is, we can see the value of that. It's probably just not gonna be grant eligible and I think we just maybe just if, if we don't want to go forward, kind of have to give up on this return on investment. But if you want to go for a future bond referendum and let's say five million dollars for for sidewalks and you're doing, inf you know, infill and maybe other projects, this has a good return on investment. Right. Five hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You get a two and a half million dollar um, sidewalk project. Yeah. I agree. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, I would support the green section along Moore Road between Royal Commons and Matthews Mint Hill Road, no problem. But I would question the need to spend more than a half a million dollars on the full project. Uh, I've toured Matthews Charter Academy, and I'll tell you the best thing that they do differently than any of the other schools in our immediate area is they have an internal driveway system and people check them in or they check in on their cell phone and their license plate and pick up their children 
in a sequential order, more so than I can say for Matthews Elementary, Crown Point Elementary, or any of the other Butler, Lebanon Elementary schools in the area. And uh, that being the case, I don't, I, I understand the desire for sidewalk connectivity. I just don't understand the need uh, to spend a half million dollars in that particular area at this time. Commissioner McCool. <laughs> Excuse me. I tend to agree with, gracious. I tend to agree with uh, Commissioner Miller. I. I live at the Bainbridge property, so I, I drive past this area a lot. And I just, I'm struggling mightily to see the need to, to you know, be rushing this at this. I don't know, it just feels kind of rushed. I think we could probably do better in other areas. I, I'd i be fine with that little piece that where we'd build a 10 foot on more, but much more than that doesn't make much sense. Honestly, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my hand around it. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. I mean, I think taking just doing the portion of more eliminates some of the need that would make it attractive to CARPO and that we need to keep in mind. Um, uh, I, I support the full project. I think that we concentrate a lot on downtown and while it's well used, um, we've seen the, the benefit of adding the sidewalk in front of um, the Briley apartments and that just adding that sidewalk right there has brought a corridor alive in Matthews. Um, that sidewalks can be transformative to areas. Um, I feel like this can be one of those sidewalks. Commissioner McCool. I do want to kind of challenge that slightly though, but you have to think by Briley, there's so many options of, you know, you got the bowling alley going down, you're going towards downtown Matthews here. You, it's really not, I mean, you got Americana restaurant and, and a few other shops and whatnot, but you're really not, there's not a destination. You know, you, there's not a lot of destination spots through this. So I, I don't, I, that's kind of where my worry is too. I guess what I see are people walking their dogs. Um, you know, somebody walking isn't going to the Jiffy Lube. They're not going to the gas stations. They are uh, walking for exercise. And I think that's where the benefit is, especially with a, uh, with a retirement community and making it maintain its affordability in that corridor by having walkable options. I understand that I'm, I'm off, I'm all for sidewalks. I'm just, you know, making sure they make sense in, in every aspect and still kind of struggling on this one. So what's the pleasure of the board? Susan, do you have some, something to add? Yeah, real quick, um, to Mayor Pro Tem Garner's point, if it's just that section between the apartments and Royal Park, it is not eligible for CARPO funding at all. Commissioner Urban. I mean, I see the long-term benefit of this. I think if Susan is talking 2029, 2027, um, we, we, we apply we push for this. We, we, we've been talking about some bonds and, and seriously needed undervalued infrastructure issues. We go in that direction um, and, and, and go for the big push over the top. So I'm, I'm, I can support this from that aspect of it, going that we have some running room on that aspect of it, and we can uh, put a bigger package together overall. And then by then, we'll also see how development infrastructure is going, because you know um, Indian Trail installings are growing at a rapid rate. This is this is a corridor that's going to link our communities together as well. And we don't know on the other side of the latest homes on Mount Harmony, the townhomes, that something won't be developing there as well. And we can begin to have some asset shared things. I like the downtown infill. I still think we need to do it. But I think if we have time, which it sounds like we have time, um, we can make the bigger play. So I, I would be in support of this. Would you like to make a motion? Sure, why not? Um, let's see, let's say, uh, let's make, make a motion to authorize town staff to pursue the STPG grant application for the entire project length of Moore Road and Margolin Drive sidewalk connectivity project. It's approximately 3,300 feet long with a town match of 549,000 
20% of the total project cost being allocated from the general fund as outlined in the memo dated October 6, 2021 by Dana Stujanki uh, to the town board and commissioners, or actually just to us, right? Yeah, mayor and board commissioners. A second. Uh, oh. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Urban, a second from Commissioner Garner. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Garner? Yes. I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. <laughs> Commissioner Miller? Do you need to turn your mic on, sir? <laughs> no. Uh, Commissioner McCool? Sure. I vote no, so that passes uh, what? Four to, two. Four to two. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the discussion. All right. All right, we'll move on to item 13A, new business, consider updates to uh, composite bicycle and pedestrian plans. Susan, you're a popular speaker tonight. Hi again, everyone. I'm super excited to be presenting this item to you because I'm not asking for money, uh, <laughs> right? I, I, that's almost all my items are asking for money, but really this is a, the composite bicycle and pedestrian plan update. And if you're not familiar with the plan, um, that doesn't surprise me, it's okay. Uh, you know, in many towns and communities, there's lots of different plans and some of them are, are conflicting. And so when staff goes to reference it or developers or whatever, they're not really sure which plan to go, to go by. So the composite bike, bike bicycle and pedestrian plan um, was, a, that project was taken on by the planning department and was adopted by the board in 2015 with the intent to compile all the bicycle and pedestrian plans into one kind of decision document. So there's the inventory part of it that says, you know, here's all the, the bicycle facilities and pedestrian facilities and all the plans, and then kind of like the, the final like composite recommendation packet. Well, um, you know, for many projects, uh, in order to um, be, apply for funding, they have to be in the plan. And so um, staff would like to update this plan now to include the multi-use paths on Moore Road, Marglin, Mount Harmony Church Road. Um, that would be not what we just discussed, but on the other side of the street should a roadway project come through to, um, to show that we have it in our plan that they have multi-use paths. Um, and also to add the Silver Line Rail Trail alignment that needs to be added. Um, and, and lastly, um, to prevent a situation of having multiple overlapping and conflicting plans, as I explained, um, there's some verbiage that is proposed in uh, this, these revisions to, um, sorry, I lost my place in my notes, um, to uh, future pedestrian bicycle plans should be included in this document in the section of updated plans that would supersede any previous plans. So uh, Darren and Dana have done a wonderful job with, with the revisions. They have listed out for you on the front, every single page where they made uh, adjustments. And those adjustments are specifically, again, for adding verbiage about um, new plans coming in, adding the Silver Line Rail Trail. So as development happens along those corridors, we can get the rail trail. And then adding the more Marglin Mount Harmony Church multi-use path. Uh, I'm happy to go through every single page of every revision. I, I know that's like probably top on your list, or maybe I can just answer any questions that you have. I, I like the latter. Um, does anybody have any questions for Susan? Can you please return to the to the gallery view? Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, was this uh, for information only or do we have a? Yeah, I probably should have ended with that too, yes. Um, so staff would appreciate it uh, if you would approve the recommended changes so we can have a good solid document uh, for development plans moving forward. Do I have a motion? Commissioner Miller. Um, I'm scrolling through the pages. <laughs> Page 18 of 109. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Can I make a motion to approve the recommended changes to the Town of Matthews Composite Bicycle and Pedestrian Plan as indicated? 
by Susan's update. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Garner, a second by Commissioner Urban. Roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Okay. Commissioner McCool. <laughs> yes. I vote yes, and that passes with uh, five what? <laughs> five yeses and one okay. So I guess that's yeah. unanimous. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thank you, Susan. Move on to item 13B, consider purchase of police department training simulator. Officer Sisk. Thank you, Mayor and the board. Um, maybe I should take Susan's approach and ask if y'all have any questions right off the bat. But um, I think we all know that uh, simulation training is the primary technique we use in law enforcement uh, to train our officers. And that's primarily because, <clears throat> excuse me, of the uh, uh, research has taught us that individuals making decisions in, uh, under stress and with limited time, we revert back to our previous experiences. And by offering repetition in, in stressful decision-making, um, we're able to train our officers um, to seek the best outcomes in our encounters. So um, in 2019, <clears throat> um, we began looking for ways to improve our uh, simulation training uh, within the department. Uh, some of the obstacles that we run into is location of uh, training sites or the availability of training sites and also safety considerations. Um, we have to scale down training or be, I shouldn't say scale down, we have to be really uh, mindful of our safety with all participants uh, and generally this involves role players um, and our officers. We gain we don't gain a whole lot when our participants get injured. It kind of defeats the purpose of our training. But we also want realistic training. So uh, in order to do that, we began looking for solutions. Uh, our research showed that computer simulated training could be a, a viable option. It's used in a number of industries, especially in high risk industries, such as aviation, uh, military uses, uh, surgical techniques are often practiced using computer um, simulation as well. Um, the, um, the research led us to a company called Bertra out of Tempe, Arizona. They design uh, de-escalation and judgmental use of force uh, training equipment, as well as curriculum that they provide to law enforcement and military organizations. Within this equipment, there's or within the curriculum, there's 96 hours of accredited curriculum dealing with a number of topics, um, primarily in de escalation and judgmental use of force. Some of the topics are uh, human factors and force encounters, contact and cover techniques, uh, mental illness, a practical approach, uh, just a straight de escalation curriculum as well as one I'm pretty excited about is special populations dealing with autism in which Bertra has worked with um, the National Autism Society to develop this curriculum. As far as the uh, hardware in the curriculum that they provide, uh, our chosen model uh, is three 10 foot screens with three overhead projectors. It also comes with all the computer equipment Associated duty equipment, which integrates with the computer simulation, such as uh, firearms, tasers, OC spray, flashlights, um, and with the firearms, it's uh, handguns as well as rifles. And they all integrate within the software and the computer um, hardware. Um, the curriculum provides up to 85 different pathways for the situations or scenarios to play out which gives us a great variety and um, versatility in our training, especially when we're dealing with de-escalation techniques. Um, it gives us instant feedback where officers can um, see their mistakes, see their successes, and hopefully ingrain the use of those de-escalation and, and proper judgment in our encounters so that that's their go-to when they're under stress and they got limited time to make those decisions. Um, this project 
would cost $119,871.77. Um, and we propose using uh, federal asset forfeiture money, which we currently have. And this is an acceptable use under the guidelines of federal asset forfeiture funding. Any questions I can clear up? Yes, sir. Give me that price again. It's uh, $119,871.77. A second question. Where are you going to locate this simulator? It'll be in our ups upstairs as you come off our elevator. We have a room uh, that's designed to fit this particular um, model, uh, the specs for it. Uh, Albert uh, with Public Works uh, was able to close in part of an area that was open that's part of, I guess the HVAC, HVAC system is in this area. We were able to wall it off, get it, uh, electricity to it, get it set up. It'll be right next to our training room. Is that going to be equipped with shoot or don't shoot simulator as well too? Yes, sir. That, those programs are also, I failed to mention that, those programs are also uh, built in the traditional high-risk stop um, um, uh, active shooter scenarios are all built, built into this along with the uh, de-escalation curriculum as well. Thank you, Cap. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Uh, Captain Sisk, so you said this would be paid for out of asset fortune fortune for, for that fund. Um, but in year three, it, it, I've calculated around $11,000, $12,000 for uh, annual uh, uh, renewal, so to speak. Would that be coming from the same fund? Yes, sir. It could. If we didn't have the funding source to, to budget it in, we, that would be an acceptable use. Okay. So, so we, we can pay to play using these particular funds at this stage in the game. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, Captain Sis, thank you for all that you do to keep us all safe. Is, uh, is this something that is more valuable in a training room on the second floor than it would be on the 95 acres um, along Highway 51 at Phillips Road or near Phillips Road? Uh, the, the, great th the great thing is that it is scalable to fit into the area that we have. Um, should we want to go bigger, there is a five screen version, which encompasses more of the peripheral vision. But we believe with this system being in a small area, the three screens are going to give us real similar to what the five screens would do. And having it here inside because of this computer equipment, being inside is uh, optimal uh, climate control. So this, this is a good area for it. I'm not concerned about climate control because your emergency situations are not climate controlled. I'm concerned about whether they're adaptable to urban setting versus rural setting and things like that. If we have 95 acres that we can put a simulated building in or, or something in, is, is this second story better? because it's more programmable than what we already own? So let me, let me answer that. Commissioner Miller, we don't own that property. We leased that property from the county. They used um, open space dollars for that. It, can, it, cannot, it could not be used for police training. It's gotta be used for recreational purposes. And, Je and Jeff, uh, simulated trainers in times past, has been in a trailer, but I think if what, what Captain was just explained to us is going to be very sufficient in any type of weather, and he's got different simulators that for different officers and department. So I think that would be a tremendous uh, asset on that second floor because I think I know where he's talking about that area. As soon as you come off the elevator to the right, is that right, Captain? Yes, sir. Yes, sir it is. Yeah, and so that for that point, Jeff. Uh, simulators in the past has mostly been on a trailer. And so, but this area gives these officers better location, better interest, and be able to do different type of simulations in that one 
when they were there. Hayes, and weren't we able to, or in discussions about building a fire training center on the 95 acres? So what we did when we purchased that property, the, we made it cut out, did a deal with the county, but we did keep two and a half acres. So the short answer is yes, there could be two and a half acres used for something like this. But I mean, it's no, you know, it's police training and parks. It's just not a very compatible uses. And really, that's what we came to with the fire station too. Is you know, smoke training or whatever at a fire station in a park. I, that was one of the compelling reasons to move it across the street. Okay. Commissioner McCool, did you have a comment? I was going to make a motion if there wasn't another comment. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the use of federal asset forfeiture funds for the amount of $119,871.77 to purchase the Virtra V180 LE-1. I may have butchered how the name, but that thing. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner McCool. Do we have a second? Yes. A second? Uh, Commissioner Whitley seconds. Uh, I'm uh, very much in favor of this. I think it's a great use of funds. And I think uh, additional training for our police to make them the most prepared they can be is can only be good. So I'm, I'm definitely for this. Commissioner Whitley? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Absolutely. And I vote yes as well. So uh, good luck, Captain. Thank you. <laughs> With your new simulator. Thank you, guys. All right. Move on to item 11C, consider funding reallocation for fire and EMS staffing. Chief Kinnebert. Uh Well, as uh, Susan said, I'm delighted to be here. I'm not asking for any additional money, uh, just the approval to reallocate that money to full-time positions. Um, You've got the memo in front of you. I'll boil it down. Uh, last Over the last 12 months, we failed to meet our minimum staffing goal. 17% uh, of the time are 124 shifts. Uh, if that trend continues, uh, we will only be able to meet our minimum staffing goal 50% of the time by January. Uh, we requested positions in this year's budget uh, Due to other constraints, they got pushed to the revaluation year, uh, but we can't wait two more years to fix a staffing problem. So what we hope to do is take existing volunteer stipend money, uh, hire three full-time persons. Uh, we have a qualified pool currently, uh, and then manage the remainder of the volunteer incentive money to have an average of two volunteers on each shift. Uh, these are full-time positions. They'll be firefighter EMTs. Uh, they're already trained. Uh, we can have them ready to go, hopefully in December. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Maybe this is premature, but because the chief is asking for reallocation to solve a significant problem in the fire department, I would like to recommend approval of the fire and EMS department's reallocation of funding and to the addition of three new positions in the town's approved position allocation. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner McCool. We'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Whitley. Yeah, uh, I have a question. I'm not, not a favor of that, but uh, Chief, are there in, in your department Best of my knowledge, you only have one person of color and one female of color. Is that correct? That is correct. In this new pool that you're talking about, hiring, is there any people in that pool that are people of color? No, sir. Uh, Commissioner Whitley, let me let me explain. Uh, when we put out our last firefighter or call for firefighter applications, we hit over 200,000 people on Facebook. 200,000 people looked at our post. We got 57 applications. And of the 27 we invited to come interview, 11 showed up. That is the battle we are fighting. 
competition for qualified firefighters is fierce. Qualified for competition for qualified uh, diversity in the applicant pool is extremely difficult. And we we did our best, but we got no qualified applicants uh, through the process. And we did have one qualified African American male, but he he did not uh, he did not perform as we would expect. In the fifty-seven that you got returned, how many of those were people of color? Mr. Whitley, I don't get that information from Human Resources. I only know who shows up at the interview. So, my, you know, my concern is this. Now, I'm, I've been doing this now with the board for six years, seven years. And, you know, this I keep saying that you cannot find qualified minority. That, that's not sitting good with me. And I'm just, I, I know that you need officers. I know uh, five, 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 an EMT. But, uh, you know, if you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. And that's, that's my concern is that you have got to be intentional to make sure going forward that we find somebody that is. Now, you know, I hear what you're saying about HR and I'm not, I know you need the people and I'm in favor of needing people, but I'm in favor of making sure we do equality and the police department and the fire department and being uh, being reflective of our community. I hear you. Commissioner Miller. Thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, my question is simple. Uh, who sets the goal of 124 shifts? Is that your standard or a typical fire standard? Uh, um, excuse me, I just had a brain fade. Uh, the manager, the manager and I have managed the fire department by a set of operational objectives since I got here mm -hmm. and eight person staffing 90% of the time is what I, in my professional opinion, think this is the minimum we can operate with. We are running almost 3,500 calls for service, 38% of the Oh, you're breaking up a little bit. Chief, pop off your video. He is. So can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the, those eight people, that's uh, two trucks at three persons per truck. And that's really not optimal. Some people would argue for four people per truck. And then you'd have two people for it. Uh, EMS. So that's where you get your eight folks from. And what we, the, the original intention of the model was for the volunteers to um, fill the gap, right? Well, that's, it's not, it's just not happening. And we, what we're trying to do is take the money that we allocated for volunteers and we're not spending and saying, okay, let's take uh, whatever, enough for three positions and convert that to one person per shift. And then we'll hire two we'll use the, uh, the remaining of this, this uh, stipend dollars for um, two uh, $10 an hour uh, volunteers. Chief just texted me, his internet died. So does that answer your question, Commissioner Miller? Sure, I'm satisfied with that, thank you. Is there any further discussion? We've got a motion and a second. Hearing none, uh, Commissioner Whitley, how do you vote, sir? No. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner McCool. Yes. And I vote yes. So that uh, passes five to one with Commissioner Whitley in opposition. All right. We'll move on to the mayor's report. Item 14, uh, during our uh, last meeting on September 27th, I think uh, quite a few people were shocked to hear 
uh, town manager Blodgett announced that he is uh, going to retire. And uh, one of the things that uh, I've often said about uh, Hazen is that he has set the course for uh, service excellence in our town and really has fostered that culture. And I think that's gonna be his enduring legacy to the town. Uh, that being said, I, I think our employees are excellent. And I, I, I don't literally don't go longer usually than a week before a citizen or somebody texts, emails, or calls me and tells me about some great thing that one of our employees has done. So I have the utmost respect for our employees. And some comments were made by, by several of us on this board um, during that meeting regarding uh, vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, of some of our employees. And a couple of our employees uh, reached out to me, they wrote me emails, and I, I appreciate that. I always want our employees to, uh, to reach out to me. I have an open door to my phone numbers published if anybody wants to talk to me or meet with me about something that our board has said or done that they deem inappropriate or they have a question. And the concern that was brought up was they thought, it was a thought that some of our comments were disrespectful. I just wanna say that my comments urging our employees to get vaccinated were born out of a genuine concern for our employees' uh, health and safety and also the health and safety of those they come in contact with. And since our last meeting, yet another individual, uh, Audrey Kell, resource officer, Julio Herrera, has passed away from COVID. So this is a, a real pressing concern in our community. And that was the intent of my comments. I, I don't want uh, to have Hazen or Becky call me sometime in the future and inform me that one of our employees has died from COVID because I believe it's preventable. I uh, have served for many years in an engineering society called ASSE, and I love their motto. Their motto is these four words, prevention rather than cure. So they believe in preventing things rather than trying to cure them after they happen. Uh, that being said, also, I understand why some people are vaccine hesitant or some of the concerns they might have. There's other questions about do you need to be vaccinated if you've already had COVID, for instance, and, and what is the benefit of that? So I've asked uh, Hazen and Becky to, to reach out to a third party um, expert, medical expert that's totally unaffiliated with the town, has no political agenda whatsoever, uh, nor do I with this regard, but just saying, uh, to answer any questions that our employees might have about the benefits and the risks of the COVID vaccine. And uh, Hazen, I don't know if you wanna touch on that a, a bit. You and I discussed it earlier today. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. So we do do a, uh, we've done two of them, town-wide calls with staff. Um, you know, we've done it about the budget. We've talked about COVID, but we're going to do another one here soon. And part of that is we're going to, we've reached out to Novant to find an expert to talk to us about, you know, vaccines, you know, the booster, just anything kind of the, the state of COVID in the United, and vaccines in the United States. So uh, I don't think we've identified somebody yet, but we are working on that. So thank you. So again, I just want to reiterate to all of our account employees that my comments, and I don't believe anyone's comments were uh, intended to be disrespectful. I, I will remind everybody that that was about uh, midnight after a seven hour meeting or so. So I think a lot of us were a little bit tired, but I, I do apologize if anyone was offended. I love our employees. I think you're awesome. I think you're excellent and no disrespect intended. So that's, uh, that's all I have for my mayor's report. Uh, we can move on to the attorney's report. No report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Craig. Move on to town manager's report. All right. I do have two quick things and I know it's running late. I apologize, but uh, Jay, would you flash up um, the police department? Um, so um, this, and I don't, I don't want to go through well. So what this is, and I'll share it with the board, but it's, it's a survey of pay. And Jay, if you'll scroll, so you can see Huntersville at 40, that's starting pay for police officers, 46.5, Davidson 44.4, uh, Stylings is almost 44. Matthews is, there's Concord at 42, I mean, Cornelius. Matthews 
is $40,600. The only community that we're above in our region is Mint Hill. And uh, this is a major concern. We, I do not, I'm not bringing a solution to you all because I know the budget was tight and we raised taxes last fiscal year, but um, we need to figure out what these other organizations are doing because uh, Davidson's a good example. Last year when we did this, we were ahead of Davidson. Stallings, we were ahead of Stallings as far as I can remember, and all of a sudden we've fallen behind. So I'm just bringing it to the board's attention. This is something we have to look at. Uh, last time I talked to the chief, I think there were six positions that were open, and I think we have a very good organization, but at some point people will look at salary and you will lose people for salary no matter what kind of culture you have. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments about that before I move on? So, uh, Hazen, I, I don't recall if I discussed this with you, but we had a, uh, a candidates forum for those of us that are running for re-election. And this uh, this came up in the candidates forum. And I, I believe I speak for everybody that's, uh, uh, that's an incumbent that's running. I think we all recognize this as a concern. I don't, and again, we don't know how we're going to resolve it. I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but we, we recognize that it's a concern and, and we certainly don't want to be, you know, 15 out of 16 and, and pay for our police officers. So we need to do something. Clearly. Yeah. And so um, about this was on September 27th, Chief Ken Kenneberg said to me, uh, um, Monroe is hiring firefighters and paying them $41,700 a year. Now, I mean, I love, there it is, Chief Kenneberg, a ton of respect, but I thought he's got to be confused. And so I reached out to the manager and there's the manager's report re response. Of course, that's my handwriting. Ours, our starting pay is 36.8. And there, so theirs is $5,000 more and they're uncertified firefighters. So that, that is really, and, and Monroe is not known as a high paying community. So it, it just, it, it's really a reality check for police and fire that in the area, something's really going on. One of the things we have talked about is premium pay, which is ARPA eligible. And that may be a way to, um, you know, whatever, pay our folks, uh, re, uh, whatever money as a result of um, the, the COVID and may buy us some time, you know, let's say until the next reval to really take a serious look at this. So uh, just that was, both of those things are just points of information for the board. I, that was my, my Jeff invitation. Uh, I, I, again, I think it's a concern and we'll have to address it. The, I, I like the idea about the ARPA funds. However, that is a temporary solution that would at best bridge a gap and we would have to um, come up with something. A permanent, permanent fix. Permanent, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's something we have to address. We just have to. Okay. So I appreciate the information. Okay, and that's all I got, man. All right. Uh, <laughs> I know it's late, but we do have one more item of uh, that we need to discuss in closed session. Uh, pursuant to North Carolina's general, general statute 143.318-11A5, we need to discuss the acquisition of real property. So we need to uh, um, log out of this Zoom session and in, into another one. And, and for the uh, for the public, and I've had this question a few times, when we go into closed session, it's not gonna be broadcast. So you won't be able to watch it. That's why it's closed, I guess. Uh, so we need to uh, I'll entertain a roll call vote to go into closed session. So we need to make can, that Can vote. we take a little break? About yes, five minutes yes, I, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you for that reminder. Uh, yeah, we'll take a, a let's take a I'll let's take a, a uh, okay we'll we'll reconvene at 10 30. we have a motion from commissioner whitley do we have a second we'll move okay second by mayor pro tem garner we'll take a roll call vote commissioner whitley yes commissioner garner commissioner urban yes commissioner mccool yes mr miller yes 
And I vote yes as well. Let's try to get back right around 1030 so we can wrap this up before tomorrow comes. And a new link, is that correct? Yes, you guys should have the new link in your email and in a calendar invitation. So leave this meeting, go into the closed session meeting. Thank you.
All right. I think everybody's back. Um, I don't see Jeff yet. Except for Jeff. Can y'all read my mind where I was going? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'll tease Jeff a little bit. Man, I thought this was going to be a short meeting tonight, Hazen. <laughs> I win. <laughs> yeah, got the over under. Uh, got the over under. Somebody asked me to predict. I said nine thirty. <laughs> He's only got a few months left. Last two weeks ago. We are a very thoughtful group. He's got a few months left. We're going to get every last ounce out of him in these meetings. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we've had two two long ones in a row. I know. Reminds me of Lee Myers days. Of course, back then Lee did all did most of the talking. Though. <laughs> yep. But two long ones. Did you mean two long years? <laughs> uh, no, two long meetings. Jeff's coming in now. All right, Mr. Miller's back. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Urban, second by Commissioner McCool. Uh, like a roll call vote. Commissioner McCool. Yes. Mr. Urban. Yes. Mr. Whitley. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mr. Miller. Yes. I vote yes. Thank you, everyone. It's a good meeting. Good night. Have a good night.